Hey listeners, this is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, where each week we have an unusually in-depth conversation about one of the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve it. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. At the start of the last episode, I gave some advice on which apps I use to listen to articles, podcasts, and books on my phone. Uh, and some people wondered if that was an ad, but crazy though it sounds, I was actually just trying to help out with some hopefully useful recommendations. The show now has over 10,000 subscribers and episodes are getting around the number of downloads in their first month, which is not too bad a result after one year. I would really personally appreciate it if you could tell your friends about the show so we can reach more people who would enjoy listening and might also be able to act on what they learn. And if you particularly enjoy an episode, why not post it on social media as well? You'll be doing me a personal favor and it's really good signaling. Regular listeners to the show will likely be interested in a series of articles we have coming out over the next year, which we're calling our Advanced Career Guide. The first is up on the site now and gives our candid views on which 11 career paths we think are most impactful. If you want to get all of those as they come out, you can subscribe to our research newsletter at 80,000hours.org slash newsletter. In today's episode, I talk with Katja Grace. Katja completed a Bachelor of Science at the Australian National University, completing her thesis in anthropic reasoning under the supervision of philosopher David Chalmers. She then started a PhD in philosophy at Carnegie Mellon University, but left to work on forecasting the future of artificial intelligence technologies. She now leads AI Impacts, an organization which tries to forecast when AI systems will achieve particular capabilities and the impacts that should be expected to have. She blogs at MediEuphoric, is a research associate at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University, and happens to have been my housemate all the way back in 2010. So here's Katja. So thanks for coming on the podcast, Katja. It's a pleasure to be here. We plan to talk about whether more people should work on the kind of technological forecasting that you're doing and how promptly people ought to wash their dishes when they both live in the same house. <laughs> but first, uh, what does AI Impacts actually do? Well, uh, I think there are two things to say about what it does. One way of framing it is that it's a research organization trying to answer big questions about the future of artificial intelligence. So is there going to be like human level intelligence at some point? What's going to happen then? Is the world going to go crazy? Is it going to be business as usual, but faster and better or something? Uh, are humans going to go extinct? What kind of AI is likely to be that good? Is it not going to be agents at all? Is it going to be something else? Um, we're interested in these high-level questions, but we're mostly answering much lower-level questions that will hopefully shed light on those. Like, for instance, what do current hardware trajectories look like? Uh, like, how much hardware is a human brain equivalent to? That sort of thing. Uh, the other thing that AI Impacts is, is a website that has a whole bunch of pages that each have like a topic, for instance, how much hardware is the human brain equivalent to, where uh, all of the considerations that we know of are written up nicely, hopefully, so that uh, an audience who doesn't know about this area that much can read them. So why do you feel that the work that AI Impacts does is uh, one of the most uh, you know, important projects in the world? Well, I think that AI risk is one of the most important problems that I won't go into the details of here. Uh, we can talk about some other time. And then I think the details of it are not very well known. Uh, like, I, I think overall, we don't understand that well what will happen. It could be that one day some sort of super AI takes over the world, or it could be that there, there are like a whole bunch of non agenty systems over a long time doing something strange, or it could be that there are various weapons. Like, we, we don't have a very good understanding of this. And I think in general, uh, if you're if you're facing a really giant problem, having a better understanding of it than no understanding or than, than a very poor understanding is is quite useful. And I think at at the moment where we are, there are just like a lot of really tractable projects you could do to have a better understanding of this, uh, which which I think would help direct efforts to like you know AI safety efforts and and uh, efforts to improve policy and governance and that sort of thing to projects that are more useful for dealing with whatever the real world is actually like. Yeah, I think there's a lot that could be done. And they say there are a very small number of people working on it. So uh, what is AI Impacts? Like how many people work on it and how long have you been running and how do you operate? So it's about two full-time people equivalent and it's been around for about three years. Okay, so it's a pretty pretty niche organization. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I guess you got, yeah, so your funding is pretty small. And uh, is everyone based in Berkeley, California? The two of us who work on it most are based in Berkeley, um, and then we have some contractors who are usually elsewhere. How do you guys choose what questions to, to look into, and how do you actually go about uh, answering these things? Well, we have a, a giant research agenda somewhere that is, is sort of like a hierarchical list of, for instance, so the, the top question is perhaps what are AI timelines like, and then 
we've sort of brainstormed the different ways you might be able to get any uh, evidence about this. So like, well, you could ask experts or you could like uh, try and work out what hardware timelines are like and what software timelines are like and like how they like how important they are and relate them somehow. Or you could try and look at sort of overall capability timelines. And I think we had some other things. And then for each of these things, you can sort of think about how you could, how you could make progress on that question. And, and so then we end up with a bunch of concrete projects that are pretty far down. And I think uh, my, my colleague, Tegan McCaslin, is currently working on figuring out how smart pigeons are. I forget how that was related to anything, <laughs> but yeah, it can get detailed. And so th then we sort of have this list of things and we try to prioritize them somewhat based on like a, a mixture of how well uh, answering a particular question will let us at least have a, a sort of first guess at um, some higher level answer that's important um, and just how well positioned anyone working at the moment is to answer the question and other kind of things like that. So uh, this area has gotten pretty hot lately, but you were you were into it uh, several years before, uh, <laughs> before people started talking about it everywhere. Um, so how, how did you end up in this field? I guess early on, I was interested in giving all of my money to poor people in Africa. Uh, and I decided maybe that wasn't the best thing to do for making the world better. So I decided I should do the best thing, I guess. Uh, so I guess I've been interested in doing the best thing since early teenagerhood or something. Um, and at some point, I think you actually introduced me to the blog Overcoming Bias, uh, <laughs> where uh, some people were talking about AI and uh, so, so I wrote to Elias Yudkowsky, who was at Overcoming Bias at the time, being like, I want to save the world. Uh, you think you can save the world like this? Do you want my help? Um, it turned out uh, nobody wanted my help at that point, given that I, I didn't know much about signaling at that point. There was really no evidence that anyone could have that it could be helpful in any way. Uh, so I eventually went to, to visit anyway, because I was on holiday in America, uh, and became friendly with some of the people there, and was invited to live in someone's garage and think about this stuff, and it seemed like a good deal. Uh, so when was that? 2008, I went to America okay. for the and, first time. And that's when you uh, like first got, to, got seriously interested in this kind of prediction of AI? Uh, it's when I, I first got interested in AI risk as a potentially potentially the best way to make the world better. And I guess prediction of it in particular, I probably got interested in in like 2014 or something like that. Yeah, what, what made you think that that was a really important thing to work on? I think I can't remember the <laughs> the exact way that things went. Uh, You're being unreasonably but... <laughs> honest here, Katya. People always just invent some story that explains why they're doing what they're doing. Right. I mean, I can I can come up with a story now in retrospect for why I think it was a good thing to do. Sure, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> it's um, on. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think AI, I think, is very likely to change the world in lots of different ways. I think it's sort of hard to imagine AI not making a big difference to the world, like in the next century or two at least, uh, and, and probably sooner. And so I think how that goes is going to make a big difference. But I also think it means that other things that might have seemed important are much less likely to be important. Like, for instance, if I thought that, um, you know, improving education of gifted children or something was important, I just think any progress that we would have made toward that is likely to be obsoleted once there's AI that's better than us <laughs> at lots of things. Obsolete and, because the AI would be able to do the work that those smart humans would be doing or, uh, or because that, it would be able to figure partly, out how to improve the education better. Yeah, both of those things. <laughs> like Probably the humans won't be employed in the long run doing thinking work and also even if you wanted to educate them well, there'll probably be better ways of improving such things. Yeah, so AI seems like it's likely to be a big deal and affect lots of things. Um, I also think the sort of mainline prediction for how it goes uh, in includes a lot of big risks. I think uh, extinction risks are, are in general the biggest problem in the world. Um, and I think ex extinction risks from AI are probably the most plausible and soon seeming ones to me. Okay, so we'll return to some of this uh, big picture stuff uh, later on. Uh, but first, uh, to kind of guide people through uh, what, why we're worried about uh, artificial intelligence in general and, uh, you know, what's kind of the, the, the baseline forecast that, that we could make, given what we know now. We'll talk about this paper that you published last year, which Altmetric Attention Score ranked as the 16th most discussed paper of 2017. Uh, so it was a very, very hot topic. It was called, uh, When Will AI Exceed uh, Human Performance? Evidence from AI, AI Experts. We'll hold out uh, a little on the audience uh, and, and cover the method before we uh, cover, the, cover the conclusions. Uh, but what did you try to do uh, in this paper? Well, we tried to uh, 
talk to a bunch of people who are publishing in machine learning in, in good conferences. So, you know, basically central machine learning researchers. And I guess we tried to ask them about all kinds of things that we were curious about. So we asked when they thought, basically human level AI, when they thought that would happen, uh, but also a whole bunch of things about how important they thought safety was, if they think the world will be destroyed, which thing, which inputs they think are important to AI progress uh, happening. A whole bunch of narrow AI near-term predictions. So like, when will when will AI be able to write a new Taylor Swift song better than Taylor Swift can? Mm. When will Taylor Swift be obsoleted? That sort of thing. <laughs> um, yeah. So what are the different levels of AI that people talk about? Because you sometimes hear, you know, human level AI or, you know, an AI that can do all of the work that humans can do better and more cheaply. And then there's also, you know, super, super intelligence, something that just like vastly outclasses humans. Uh, it sounds like you were asking about an AI that can do all of the jobs that humans do equally as well. Yeah, I think there, there are basically two kinds of things people talk about, where one of them is something like human level AI and one of them is something like vastly superhuman AI. I think when people talk about human level AI, say they are often vague on the details that might matter a lot. For instance, there's AI that can do what a human can do, but for like a billion dollars an hour is different from AI that can do what a human does at the price of a human. And, and often people are ambiguous about which one they're talking about. Also, like, are we thinking about physical tasks as well? Like, does the robotics have to be ready? So I guess when we were writing the survey, we probably spent like half a day thinking about what the definition of this should be exactly. Mm -hmm. And, and ended up asking about, well, I guess we, we asked about two different definitions, basically, which we thought should be quite similar, but we got very different answers for them. One of them was meant to be quite similar to the past surveys, and it was, when will AI be able to do every task that a human can do, uh, at least as well as, I think, like the, the best human at doing that task, not like an average human, because that was a previous ambiguity where people were like, oh, we'll have human level AI, but it won't really be able to do AI research or anything, because, you know, a human can't usually do AI research, they have to be an AI researcher. Hmm. And so we asked about the, the sort of best human performance, and I think... Uh, there's also a question of like, does it need to be one machine that can do all of these things? Or does it have to be that for any task, there is some machine that can do it as well as a human? Or that you could develop one if you try it. Yeah. yeah. So I forget the exact details here, but I think we asked about machines can do this thing somehow. So how many people did you survey and what was the response rate like? We surveyed roughly 1,600 and 21% of them responded. So that's 352 people. So how did you like produce this list? Did you have to look all across the internet for every ML researcher? Maybe you maybe got a list of people invited to a conference? <laughs> yeah, so uh, it, was, it was everyone who was published at NIPS or ICML, which are two big machine learning conferences mm -hmm. in 2015. So we were doing this in 2016. And I guess both of those conferences have all of their papers online. So we basically just went through their papers and got their email addresses from them. Did you do any fancy stuff like kind of randomizing the order of the questions or, you know, giving people different questions or um, like pre-committing to do a particular style of analysis ahead of time? Oh, we did all of those things and, and more. Uh, we, <laughs> don't, don't, what, what's, the, what's the more? Uh, I think the, the thing that I thought was best actually was we basically made a survey with all the questions and, uh, and then we ran a bunch of interview versions of it where we like sat down with a particular person and got them to answer it in front of us. And then after every question, we're like, so what did, uh, what do you think that question meant then? <laughs> mm -hmm. Why did you write that? Uh, and, and doing that, we discovered some things that I guess had been in previous surveys and people had just assumed were well understood. Like people were just completely missing the point of the question, potentially. Like, I think there's a question about how soon is there super intelligence after there's human level intelligence or something. And people were just like not noticing super intelligence <laughs> instead of human level or something. Oh, so, wow. And so we did a bunch of rounds of that, of like adjusting the questions and trying again, and so on, which makes me feel much better about the questions being understood. Okay. So uh, I've, I've heard that running surveys can be a colossal pain in the ass, basically, <laughs> that uh, you know, to get quite simple results, it can take an awful lot of time and an awful lot of follow-up. So, so was, this, was this a huge pain in the ass? Yes. <laughs> it's probably the biggest pain in the ass of any project I've ever done, I want to say. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, specifically, how was, it, how was it so bad? I guess it was the effort was spread out over like more than a year, I think. So I think it's just like an ongoing background thing. I, I feel like the writing a paper aspect of it was actually much more annoying than I thought. And, and maybe uh, I'm not usually in the habit of writing papers, which is uh, partly because I expect it to somehow be like much more arduous than 
than writing up a page about it on AI impacts. <laughs> um, it's a bit mysterious to me why that is. Is it because uh, it's like it's a different style that people are less familiar about, you know, with, with writing in, or is it that uh, perhaps because it feels so important, you know, it's easy to get very anxious and sensitive <laughs> about every everything that you're writing when when you think it's a paper? There's probably some of some of both of those, and I guess uh, for AI impact, since it's sort of like it's my thing, I can just be like, okay, I've decided the writing should be like this, mm. uh, and it's no big deal to anyone else. I guess I <laughs> I usually don't work. work so closely in collaboration with other people. My guess is that collaborating is somewhat harder than not collaborating. Right. Well, because everyone wants to have their say on what it should be exactly. Yeah. Or just like, like if I write a thing on AI impacts, it's not necessarily going to bother anyone. Like I'm not really doing it on anyone else's behalf. Whereas I think anything where it seems like you might be doing a bad job of something and it matters to someone else, I think it's harder. Like, I guess both of us were on Overcoming Bias before, and I think I found it harder to write on Overcoming Bias than on my own blog, because, <laughs> you know, it's like someone else's thing is at stake. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So uh, when you were putting together this survey in 2015 and 16, uh, how reliable did you expect the answers from these machine learning experts to be? Uh, you know, did you think that they were in a good position to predict uh, when AI would be able to do various different things? I think it was a fairly open question uh, how reliable they would be. I mean, one thing that's been clear in the long run is that, um, I mean, in, in many surveys of AI experts, is that they give a fairly wide variety of different answers to the same question, which suggests that any given person is incorrect. Uh, <clears throat> however, like in, in many cases, like in predicting how many jelly beans there are in a jar, you can like put lots of people's predictions together and, uh, and get a better answer. So I think it was unclear ahead of time whether... Uh, timing of AI things was like that. Um, was something that they really had knowledge about. Yeah, uh, where everyone has a sort of noisy estimate. And if you look at the average, maybe it's good. I, I think I would have thought that I, I would expect them to be more reliable on something like if AI was going to happen in five years, they would be noticing or something. And so maybe I wouldn't expect them to know like exactly which year it's going to happen or something, or definitely I wouldn't expect them to know that. Uh, but I might expect them to be able to tell the difference between like in three years and in 50 years or something. So if they're all saying in 50 years, that's like some evidence against three years. So let's get to the results from the survey. You asked about high level machine intelligence, which uh, is an achievement when unaided machines can accomplish every task better and more cheaply than, than human workers. So uh, when did ML researchers think that we'd be able to, to, uh, to get there? Uh, it's a bit complicated because we asked them in several different ways and combined the, re combined the results uh, complicatedly. But our final result was 45 years. However, we also asked them a very similar question. We, uh, well, we thought a fairly similar question uh, about when all occupations would be fully automatable. That is, for any occupation, machines could be built to carry out the task better and more cheaply than human workers. So not necessarily that they were automated, but just that it would be possible to without spending too much time and effort on it. And for that question, their answer was in 120 years, even though if you put these questions side by side, people often agree that automating all current human occupations should be a subset of all tasks that humans can do, automating all tasks. <laughs> so they got, it, they got it around the wrong way and also off by like a factor of almost three. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like they're answering a very similar question very differently based on exactly how it's framed. The occupations one was also different in that we got them to think about some particular occupations ahead of time. Like, when do you think a surgeon will be, like, when do you think all parts of being a surgeon will be automated? When do you think all parts of being an AI researcher will be automated? What do you think is a occupation that will be very late to have, to, to be entirely automated? So, so we sort of, we gave them a step-by-step -step process that led into that. It had a few more steps I didn't mention there, but... Interesting. Okay. So hold on. So this 45 years and 120 years, they were kind of the median response that people gave when they said it was 50-50 likely that would have high level machine intelligence? It's something like that, except that we also divided up. Uh, we divided the people again. So for each of these questions, half of them were asked in 20 years or in 40 years, what do you think the chance will be? Uh, uh, or I forget exactly what the numbers of years were, but for three different numbers of years, what is the probability they will that it will have happened by that year. Mm. Um, and the other half were given probabilities and asked, in what year will there be that probability? Like, In what year will there be a 10% chance of this having happened? In what year will there be a 50% chance? So these numbers are the sort of 
median of if you if you turn all of these estimates into distributions and then uh, take the median, it's that number. Okay, that that makes sense. So so in one case you went from the year to the probability, and in the other case you asked them to go from the probability to the year. Yeah, and they gave quite different answers. They gave consistently different answers. I, I think they were. I forget exactly how much they're off by. I think something like 10 years or something. We, we also did this for the narrow task questions that I mentioned earlier. Like when will AI be able to build things out of Legos or something according to instructions. And we also gave the same questions to uh, mechanical Turk people. And uh, across like lots of different questions and different people, they uh, or different groups of people, they always, or, or most of the time, thought that the distribution was earlier if they were given... Uh, probabilities and asked in what years they would happen rather than the other way around. Huh, okay. So we've got two slightly odd things here. Uh, one is that if you ask about when everything's going to be automated, well, when all human jobs will be automated, they say that it's going to take way longer than having a, an AI that can do all things that humans can do, but more cheaply and just as well or better. Right. And then you've also got this oddness that when people are asked about the probability, then are asked to give the year, then they predict that it will happen sooner. Then when they when they're given the year and then asked for the probability, right? Interesting. Uh, so when you were doing when you give these forty five and one hundred twenty year figures uh, with the, the probability to year versus year to probability thing, you just kind of take the average of the two of those of those answers because you gave half to one and half to the other, something like that. But it, it's a bit tricky to average them because we, we sort of have different points in distributions for both. So what mm. we did was turn them all into distributions that were likely for the three points that we had for each person. Like we're making some assumptions about what their distributions might look like. And then uh, then we have these overall distributions and we can take the median overall distribution. Okay. Uh, so do you have an explanation for uh, the, the first peculiarity that you get 45 years in one case and 120 years in another case for two questions that seem very similar? I, I don't have a firm idea of this, but I think there are several plausible explanations. Like one is in the occupations case, we just ask them to think about concrete things in a lot more detail than in the other one. Mm. So like maybe when they think of old tasks, they're mostly thinking of things you can do in five minutes that don't involve anything else. And and once you're thinking of occupation, you're like, oh, well, in order to be a surgeon, maybe you need to like have some sort of high level thing going on over many hours that you're doing. And maybe that wasn't the thing they thought of as tasks. So that's one kind of thing. Uh, I guess we also interviewed some AI researchers early on and asked them about some things to do with what we were going to ask, ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of them said that he thought that the surveys so far had the survey and the people who were understanding the questions quite differently. Uh, and, he, and he suggested that we ask this question about occupations because he thought we would get a very different answer. So, phase points for him. <laughs> uh, and I think his thought was what was going wrong was people were understanding human level to mean level of a sort of basic human without any skills or anything. So they were saying like human level in 20 years, but uh, can do AI research in 60 years or something. And mm. and that was sort of making sense to them because that's beyond human level. Mm. Uh, so it's possible that he's right about that. Though we also tried to make our question clearer that that was definitely not what it was about, I think. But people don't read questions that <laughs> carefully, probably. Yeah. Do you know how long roughly they spent filling out these these surveys? Is it possible that just they're, they're, they're barely giving it any thought? Uh, I think it seems likely that they're barely giving it any thought. I can't remember how long it actually took them. I think we were aiming at the end to make them take about 12 minutes. Okay. So that was 12 minutes to answer, what, like 10, 20, 30 questions, something like that? Something like that. It was somewhat complicated by different people getting randomly different questions and some of the questions asking for like three different probabilities for like four different things or something mm. where it's kind of one question with lots of parts. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I think they can't have spent very long on each. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. So uh, what about the uh, fact that they gave uh, shorter timelines for the development of AI when they were asked about the probability and then asked to give the year rather than the other way around? Yeah, I think we're pretty unsure why that was. My own guess is something like, or my own speculation, which I'm not very confident in, is is that people would basically like to give low probabilities all of the time if they possibly can. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you give them different years and ask for the probability, then they just give low probabilities for all of the years. Whereas if you give them some high probabilities and they have to figure out something to mm -hmm. do with them, then they're like, well, let's put it really far out, like in 50 years or something. <laughs> uh, whereas if you'd given them 50 years, they would have given a low probability. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's interesting. So, um, just to be clear, each person only got one of those, one of those directions, right? They didn't do both of them. Correct. Uh, each person had to give three answers, but they're all of the same type in, in a given question. Yeah. So I guess, uh, does this show that it's super important to do this cross checks where you ask questions different ways and then see, uh, whether people give radically different answers? I think so. Yeah. Which I guess we suspected a little bit ahead of time, which is why we did that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. Is this so. the first time that one of these surveys into like, you know, the views of machine learning researchers on, on you know, when, when AI will appear has done these kind of cross checks? So I guess the, the previous surveys that I know of were probably not of machine learning researchers, et cetera. They're, each one is sort of a different demographic. I can't think of any other ones that had that much cross checking. And I, I think also, an interesting thing is that the past ones basically always asked about, it uh, gave probabilities and asked in which year they were. So this suggests that all of the past surveys were maybe saying AI would be sooner than if you did the average of these or something. And I guess they were also all asking the question about when will AI be able to do all tasks rather than like occupations. So of the sort of four ways that we asked here, the past surveys were basically asking in the most optimistic possible or soon possible way. Yeah. So... Uh, you know, uh, coming out of this this part of the survey, uh, what do, what do you think now about whether machine learning researchers kind of have any have any wisdom to share about you know <laughs> uh, when when uh, high level AI is going to appear? Uh, I think that directly asking them when high level AI is going to appear is probably pretty uninformative. Uh, mm. I, I probably still think that like if it was very close, I, I would expect to get um. a bunch more close answers. Uh, but yeah, I think we should heavily discount. <laughs> the, the possibility like i don't think we should just like ask them when they think it is and then take that as our main guess i think it's like a small amount of evidence though so I, th I think i think there might be good ways to to use ai experts in combination with other things to like come up with good estimates like there might be better forecasting methods and that sort of thing i guess you could uh, just to begin with you could get them to actually spend some time thinking about <laughs> it and uh, trying to try to form a consistent view inside their own head yeah we actually asked them whether they had done that um but we haven't uh done anything with that information yet did you know what fraction of them did that i don't remember but i think it was relatively it was like high compared to my guess i remember thinking. <laughs> I think they might have been over overstating how much thought they put into it i'm not sure I, I could just be wrong about how much they think about this mm. yeah so uh, there was a bunch of other interesting um findings i guess we should we should take them all with a pinch of salt but at least uh <laughs> kind of the differences between the answers that people uh, gave were, were often interesting and almost even if even if the answers uh, aren't like right on average you can still see how people differed and I guess for other questions, we tried to ask more about things that they would actually know about. I mean, mm -hmm. I think they are experts on AI. Yeah. It's just that, like, what are the social consequences of this and when is it happening or not closely related to their expertise. Yeah. So let's, let's go through a bunch of those. One, one thing I noticed in the, in the first figure is uh, you had these, these curves drawn out, these probability distribution curves uh, yeah. uh, of, of when high-level AI would appear for a bunch of different um, individual people in the, in the, in the survey. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like there, there were a number who seemed to think that it would, it was almost a hundred percent likely to happen in like 10 or 15 years. Uh, oh, yeah. Does that just suggest that they were misunderstanding the, the question? My guess is that they're not. I think that, I think there's like a, a subsection who are very optimistic. Hmm. Yeah. I guess fortunately that, well, uh, I guess fortunately <laughs> they they get somewhat washed out in the median estimates, right? Because I mean, well, I mean, yeah. and, they're, and also that they're they're also <laughs> kind of counterbalanced by people who say there's virtually no chance of this happening even in hundred years. Yeah, uh, so you've got kind a, of some like it's a very um, very open question. It seems like we yeah. we, we also asked them uh, how much they thought their own views disagreed with that of the the typical AI researcher, and actually, I, I think the most popular answer was like little. Which, which surprised me. Like, I think maybe they didn't realize how much disagreement there is. Interesting. So they were just all over the shop from like believing it's going to happen certainly very soon to there's almost no chance it will happen even in centuries time. And they yeah. all thought everyone agree agreed with them. Well, they at least oh. thought that they agree with the typical person. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so they all thought they were close to the middle. I guess. <laughs> um, I, I haven't looked in detail at like whether the ones who think they're close to the middle are more likely to be close to the middle at least. But yeah, it seemed like their overall view was in favor of, yeah, we're pretty agreeing. So, so I think part of the value of this kind of thing is like, even if the, the forecasts aren't very good, it's nice to have a baseline of what people think so that people can then talk about it more. Like, yeah. know that other people are thinking this might happen soon. Yeah. Okay, so we're, we're pretty skeptical of their answers about, you know, the long-term development of AI and, like, the things that are, are, are quite a long distance from what um, machine learning is capable of doing now. But mm -hmm. uh, I guess uh, we, we might put more stock in their views about what things are going to happen in the next five or ten years and, you know, where, where there's already projects basically working on these things. Yeah. 
So uh, do, do you want to like talk about some of the things that they thought would be most likely to happen happen soon? So I guess for for a whole bunch of the, th- the narrow things we asked them about, they thought they would happen like within the next 10 years. So I think the, the very soonest one was play Angry Birds at human level. And there's a I think there's a annual Angry Birds contest yeah. uh, that last I looked was getting close. <laughs> there's folding laundry, playing Starcraft. There were various translation ones, uh, assemble Legos based on Lego instructions so that involves like reading the instructions and doing the, the manual thing, playing all Atari games, reading text out loud, writing a high school essay, uh, explaining your own actions in a game as well as being able to play the game well. Just something that um, machine learning algorithms can't really do now at all very well. Like they can't really explain why they're taking the making the choices that they that they are. Uh, I don't know much about it, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's right. So I, I think that one was a little over 10 years, um, but the ones I mentioned earlier, I think were all less than 10 years away. So part of the hope here, even if we're not sure how much to trust these predictions, is uh, that in 10 years, we'll know how it went at least. Oh, okay. So you're saying, uh, you know, uh, we won't have to wait that long to see whether they were just way off on these predictions. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, I guess, you know, within the next five years, we can know how they how they were doing on Angry Birds and the World Series of Poker and maybe some others here. Well, actually, I mean, given that they filled it out in 2016, we're already basically two years out. So, yeah, um, yeah <laughs> maybe even next year we'll find out when they were right about Angry Birds. <laughs> yeah. So what's uh, one of the first, you know, actual jobs that they were suggesting might be, might be automatable at, at a reasonable cost? Uh, I think truck driver. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, but we didn't really ask them about what they think is the are going to be very early jobs. We asked them about four specific jobs, which I think were truck driver, retail salesperson, surgeon, and AI researcher. And then we asked them for things that they thought would be very far off. And so I guess retail salesperson was the next one at a little under 15 years. Mm. So I noticed there was a telephone banking operator. Which oh, I- yeah. <laughs> this chart actually mixes together the occupations where we said they had to be entirely automated and some narrow tasks. So I feel like the definitions are slightly different, but um, the telephone banking operator is probably like being able to carry on the conversation on the telephone, not necessarily anything else that a telephone banking operator does in life. I don't know. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, that was pretty soon as well. Hey. That was uh, under 10 years. Yeah, have you seen the the Google Duplex? Uh, I've okay. heard rumors about it. I haven't actually watched the thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I checked this out a couple of weeks ago. Uh, yeah. yeah, basically Google's been working on, I guess, this voice system that can call up businesses and book appointments, and you know, ask them things like when, are, what are their opening hours, and you know, can kind of schedule a haircut, when can we can we reserve a table, that kind of thing. I mean, obviously, it's like a fairly narrow domain in a sense, but within that, it can deal with you know background noise and weird accents and people giving kind of non standard responses to these questions. It can guess what, like what people what people are meaning. It's really better than I am then. <laughs> and it's also um, speaks in a surprisingly human way. Uh, like mm-hmm. the, the the people on the other end of the phone don't usually pick up that they're not speaking to a real human because <laughs> it kind of pauses at that the, at the right points based on you know how long a human would normally think uh, before answering a question like that. <laughs> it, it does um and ah. So if you, you know ask like uh, how many people are, are you do you want to book this table for? It goes like ah, oh, well, it's seven. <laughs> uh, so they've done a whole lot of uh, things to to mimic uh, humans, um, and it seems like. I guess, you know, Google's been, uh, it turns out, investing quite a bit in this because they they see uh, some value in using this as kind of an assistant that I guess suppose they can sell on Android phones and things like that. Uh, They're also planning, I think, to to call up businesses all the time asking what their opening hours are so they can keep Google (laughs) Maps up to date. Yeah, Uh, So they've been throwing some money at this. But Mm. it seems like they're actually perhaps not that far off uh, being able to have a basic, you know, a telephone operator. Yeah. So I guess we we might also learn in two years that all of these things they thought would happen in 10 years actually happen in two years. And then we can be like, oh, dear. (laughs) (laughs) So that would be, uh, I guess, exciting slash uh, (laughs) nerve-wracking. Terrifying, yeah. Um, um, yeah, uh, maybe maybe before we put this up, I'll take a look at uh, what's the state of the art in, in Angry Birds playing machine yeah. learning. And, and we, we can we can see uh, how right they were about that that, yeah. that soonest one. Were there any other kind of peculiar or amusing results that uh, showed up when you when you analyzed the data? I guess uh, I had fun looking through the list of occupations that people thought would be very late uh, to be automated. For instance, train driver was one of them, um, which I was confused by, although. Maybe they're thinking, well, train drivers look like they could be automated now, but we still have them. So apparently they're doing some sort of mysterious magic. Perhaps they're thinking but, more about the politics than, right. the, than the machine learning. Yeah. <laughs> apparently they have evaded uh, automation. I think other ones that were up there were like psychiatrist and author mm. and philosopher. 
Yeah, I guess that makes sense. I suppose humans barely know what, what's good performance in this domain. So <laughs> yeah, it's probably pretty hard for the machine learning to, to figure it out as well. Yeah. Uh, I also, I mean, I noticed that AI researcher uh, showed up as, as pretty hard. Um, is that just, <laughs> yeah. just self flattery, do you think? Or? Uh, I don't think so. I think they often put other jobs as substantially later than AI researcher, like when we ask them what they think will be late. If I recall, usually it wasn't AI researcher. <laughs> um, uh, so I think they, they said it was later than the other three that we gave them, but I think, I don't know, truck driver and retail salesperson doesn't seem that surprising to me that they think AI research is harder than they think. Yeah, uh, fair enough. Yeah. So, you know, within the AI safety community, uh, people tend to think that once you got to the point where an AI could itself be very good at programming uh, AIs, then you'd get a, you know, a pretty pr- pretty rapid increases in abilities because you've got this positive feedback loop that the smarter it gets, the better it can program itself to make itself even smarter. But I noticed that it didn't seem like uh, the people responding to the survey had, had that perspective because they, in, in one case, said that it would potentially take decades after you had, um, uh, you know, uh, the AIs were, were the best in the world at doing AI research before they could be able to automate all, all tasks cheaply. Yeah, uh, we actually, we asked them directly about this too. Uh, so we asked them what they thought the chance was that the intelligence explosion argument is broadly correct. And 12% thought it was more than 80% likely to be correct. Uh, 17% thought it was more than 60, but less than 80. So, um, yeah, and 21% for about even. So I guess, I think views were sort of leaning toward no, but spread across the board more than you might think. Okay, so like more people thought that that was unlikely than likely, but it basically yeah. there was like a pretty a decent number of people who thought it was very likely, and a decent number of people who thought it was ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, and the not likely was wasn't sort of like close to zero. It, you know, there are a bunch of people for like twenty percent chance of this being mm. right. Uh, we also asked them. I guess we, we tried to ask about the intelligence explosion in several different ways as well. It, a similar line of reasoning to the when will AI happen thing. So we also asked them what they thought the chance was that global technological progress would dramatically increase at this point, which mm. we thought was sort of close. So we asked them about uh, two years after high-level machine intelligence and 30 years after. And so I think the median answers were 20% chance and 80% chance of uh, global technological progress dramatically increasing. So I guess I think they're saying like the 20% chance that within two years it's sort of undergone an abrupt increase mm. uh, and 80% chance that like 30 years later it is much faster, which might have been like a ah, slow change to that. Okay. And uh, so what did they think about the, uh, you know, whether progress in machine learning overall would be would be positive or negative for the world? I think they had a, a broad mixture of views. <laughs> we asked them to divide 100% between like five different outcomes between sort of very good and terrible, where I think we gave them examples like, uh, for instance, human extinction, mm-hmm. roughly. I think like the, the median answer was like 5% that it would be terrible. So the median person thought there was a 5% chance that oh, um, exactly. progress in machine learning would result in human extinction or something mm-hmm. similar. Yeah, something similarly bad. Right. And uh, I noticed there was like a decent fraction who thought that it would be neutral, right? Something like 20% <laughs> thought that it would just on balance, like not really make very much difference. Yeah. I'm not sure what's up with that. I, <laughs> I looked over... For, for all of these questions, we sort of randomly chose a few people to ask them afterwards, like... I forget the exact things, but sort of like, what were you thinking there? Yeah. Um, and so I looked over that, but was not able to figure out what was up. There were some things that were like, well, we, we think it's going to be um, terrible for some people, but great for some other people. Maybe it's going to be great for rich people and that some people are going to suffer. And it's, oh, okay. So it's going to be kind of like... So we can make life better in some ways, but worse than others, like yeah. a lot of normal technology does. Yeah. Okay. Not, not like uh, everything's just going to be the same necessarily. Yeah, so I guess uh, most of the people that I know think that uh, if we had uh, human level or you know far above human level machine uh, intelligence, then uh, it would either be extremely good or extremely bad. That this this middle ground kind of doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> yeah. do, do you think has this convinced you at all to reconsider this, this middle <laughs> path, or do you th- do you still think it's implausible? And if they thought about it more, they'd, they'd be convinced otherwise. Maybe it causes me to think it's slightly more likely. Though my guess, my guess is that they're mistaken. I think that uh, also part of what's probably going on is. I don't know if you ask if you ask someone to divide something between five buckets in a row. I feel like it's just intuitively weird to put to put it all in the end buckets and like nothing mm. in the middle bucket. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, no, I can I can see that because normally you put a lot in the middle and right. then a little on the edges, but here yeah. you're being asked to do a U shape. Yeah, and I think it, it makes sense to put a bunch in the 
non-edge, non-middle ones as well. Mm. Like, you know, not extinction, but things go quite badly or quite well. Okay, yeah, but this kind of, uh, it doesn't really make much difference one way or the other. Seems seems pretty odd. Yeah. I guess, I don't know, if you if you look at past technology, I feel like it's gone pretty well overall, but I, I know that other people disagree with that. Uh, so maybe those people would say, if we extrapolate, perhaps we should expect it to continue being entirely ambiguous, whether it's uh, going well or bad. Yeah. <laughs> So what are some of the other ways that uh, people gave um, strange, strange answers? Uh, so one thing that was strange was we've had these past surveys, which were sort of of different groups and so on, but basically people who know about AI. And since then, there's been this big boom in uh, machine learning, or like deep learning in particular. And uh, so you might think that people now would, be, would think that uh, we are much closer. But in fact, I think they thought... They gave slightly further out years, uh, and it's sort of unclear what happened there. <laughs> hmm. I mean, also, these are people working in machine learning. So you might think that the people working in the field that is going really well, just after it went really well, <laughs> would, would think it was coming sooner than other people in the past. But no. Yeah, interesting. I, I suppose maybe one answer would be that they've like realized that it's harder than they thought a few years ago, even though they're making progress on narrow tasks. Yeah. yeah. I think... An- Another explanation I've heard is sort of sociological, like, uh, there is sort of, um, there's a temptation to be like, oh my god, this is amazing, we're going to take over the world soon, Mm. and then uh, that's sort of embarrassing, and there's like a story that you shouldn't be like too optimistic about AI, Mm. that like it's always been tempting to say, well, we're going to have amazing AI soon, and everyone will laugh at you. So it's important as a researcher on the thing that is going really well to, to be like, no, everything's fine. Everything's just going to go slowly and we'll make some progress. Mm. And the more things are going well, the, the more people feel the need to stick to this um, calm, not over-optimistic narrative. I, I don't know how likely that is, but I, I think maybe like multiple people I've mentioned this to have, have said something like that. I think. Right. Okay. So like the faster things are going, the more people feel like they have to seem like sober people who are, who are not getting over enthusiastic about what's going on. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. That would be a bit perverse if like the faster <laughs> things go, the longer people, the people will say it takes <laughs> longer and longer. Presumably at some point they'll crack, but. Uh, so yeah, on, on this general topic, there's a couple of folk myths that uh, people always, always uh, tell me about when I, when I talk about <laughs> these forecasts of AI development. Uh, one is that you know oh, people always predict that some revolutionary technology is going to appear in in twenty years time, uh, which I guess is like long enough that people will have forgotten the forecast by the time it happens, but not so far off that people totally lose interest in the thing that they're working on. Did the survey kind of support that or, or reject that? The view that everyone gives a similar prediction seems clearly wrong, and <laughs> that people give predictions that are across the board. As far as like, do their predictions stay the same over time? Since we just have one survey. It- at this point, this survey probably doesn't say a lot about that. Uh, we've previously looked at other surveys that exist, and also, I guess, a lot of... Actually, I guess the thing we've looked at is sort of public statements about AI predictions. Like at some point, some people collected, like, every time they could find that someone came out in public and was like, I think there's going to be AI in 2046 or whatever, and, and wrote them all down. Uh, and looking at those things, I think the the distribution of when people were saying AI might be like in terms of how many years out they were saying it might be, was sort of similar in the kind of earlier half of the data as in the later half of the data. So you're saying like over time, people have become less confident about or more more dispersed in their predictions about when you'll get high level machine intelligence? Uh, No, I guess I'm saying like, I guess this data set doesn't have very many early predictions. And the early predictions were uh, earlier, uh, like shorter timelines. Okay. Um, But for the more recent ones and the very recent ones, it looks like the the median is kind of like 30 years and it sort of remained 30 years in like, ah. the, the earlier and the later set. So I think this does support this people having roughly the same distribution over time somewhat. Uh, though it's all kind of messy and there are lots of biases going on in the whole data set and it's a real mess. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> but, uh, so, so I guess there's two different ways that you could uh, phrase this idea. Uh, one is that, uh, you know, Currently today, everyone thinks it's going to take 20, 20 years or 30 years or something like that. Yeah. Uh, I guess the other would be that, that consistently in the past and today, that the average has been about 20 or 30 years. And you're saying that that second one is true. Or there's some evidence that that second one is true, that like fairly consistently, the, the middle answer has been about that time. About 30 years, something like that. Uh, though the, the very early forecasts were at least somewhat earlier. Interesting. So uh, I was just looking at this graph. So, so on the first one, it looks if uh, 
the fraction of respondents who said that the probability of high-level machine intelligence would be 50% uh, in between, say, 15 years and 30 years is only about 20% of them. So I guess it doesn't support that overwhelmingly they're tending to give this kind of uh, middle ground answer that it's uh, you know an intermediate amount of time. But actually, uh, the other thing you were talking about... Um, Brings us to the next question I was going to ask, which is, you know, how have things changed uh, dramatically over time? Because there's this kind of uh, folk story that people have that people have always said that AI is, you know, 20 or 30 years out. Or that people were saying this in the 40s and 50s and they were saying it in the 70s and 80s and now they're just saying the same thing today. So we should be a bit skeptical because uh, nothing ever changes. Uh, I guess (laughs) I've heard two complaints about early uh, AI forecasts where I guess one complaint is that people have always predicted the same thing. The other one is that early forecasts were just in incredibly naive and like we're going to do this this summer or something yeah uh my impression is that like so i guess we collected these statements we only know of like six or so that are like before 1980 even but huh. still i think some of them were relatively early and i think those were somewhat early i remember they were sort of like 15 or 20 years instead of like the 30 year median for later times huh. um but there was also a, a big survey in like 1972 uh, or, or like big relative to this smattering of other data points we have. This was the Mishi survey where it was a survey of computer scientists rather than AI people. But I think their their answers then to when they thought AI would come look fairly similar to later ones. Like the median answer was 50 years or something. Which isn't so far off what we're getting today. Right. Yeah. And it's like, it only had a few buckets. Like I think it had to be like 25 years or 50 years or something like that. You couldn't give any answer you wanted, so it's like less informative. Could you give later? Presumably you could give later than 50 years, right? Yes, but if, uh, it was 50 or over 50 was the next bucket. Oh, so that like, makes it quite hard to then. But I guess you could still take the median, potentially might be 50. So. Right, yeah. The me- I think the median is 50. So j- just to back up for a second, so you had those, you said that you found like six kind of predictions, what, in the media or in like books uh, that, that people had made uh, personally about when they thought AI, or, you know, you get human level AI. Uh, it was that kind of thing. We actually didn't collect the data. Some other people collected it for MIRI, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, and then we took it over. So I suppose with only six <laughs> six predictions, there's not that much you can say. But presumably, yeah. you'd expect those predictions to be weird because this is a this is an oddly selected group of people who decided to make predictions about this off their own bat. Yeah, uh, and I think comparing this whole data set of sort of public statements that people have made about AI, like where they just made their own prediction and put it up in public, they're somewhat earlier than the survey data. This is after we're like trying to control a bit for the different groups of people involved. So like so some of the people in, in the surveys and in this statement data, um, some of them are AI researchers. Some of them are AI researchers focusing on AGI, so uh, artificial general intelligence. So like making things that are sort of like humans, something like that, rather than sort of more narrow like translation AI or something. Uh, and those people seem to be like reliably more optimistic about when AI will come. And so we tried to take into account those differences in populations to like figure out what the other biases are based on different groups and so on. So all of this is messy. <laughs> yeah, but there is there is some evidence that the median forecast has been fairly constant over time, uh, at least like you know based on the based on the little data that we have. Is is that um, unreasonable though? You know, could could it just be rational to always think that something is uh, roughly 30, 30 years off? Uh, yeah, I think. Uh, if you didn't know anything about what was going on, I think there are like different priors that might be reasonable to have. And I think uh, at least one of the fairly reasonable ones to have would behave like that. Okay, we're just like, uh, I guess until you start seeing it happening, then you just always think it's going to be roughly a constant period of time away. Right. Huh, interesting. Okay, uh, so does that suggest that uh, that people are kind of adopting this, this kind of prior? I assume this is some sort of like uninformed uh, prior where you just say, well, I don't really know, so... It could be anywhere between now and forever, and so the middle ends up being at some point, and it's just kind of always there. Uh, something like that. Uh, I mean, I very much doubt that people have thought through this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure to what extent their intuitions being something like that are yeah. is sort of aligned with reality. Okay, yeah, well, they're, maybe they're adopting it by accident. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think another another bit of another bit of folk wisdom is that people always uh, predict that you'll get a transformative technology uh, just around the time that they die. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because I guess then they're off the hook for uh, for any of the predictions that they made. 
Um, so that would mean that, uh, that I, older people are more optimistic. I think it's also supposed to be because then they don't have they they can imagine that they don't die, right? Oh, okay. So then, then they'll be able to live forever because there'll be an AI that will save them. Something okay. like that, yeah. Or like they'll get to see the thing, but otherwise maximally far out. Uh, yeah, but I think that I think this theory is just wrong. Yeah, <laughs> I think um, there's been like some some effort to check people's expected lifespan and their predictions and i think they're just not very related yeah. all right so <laughs> another bunch of questions you asked about uh were concerning kind of our risks from artificial intelligence and the attitude of these researchers towards a safety oriented machine learning research uh what did what did that turn up well about just under half of them were in favor of more efforts going on safety than are currently uh, happening yeah. and roughly the other half were in favor of the current level and very few people thought that there should be less effort mm. um, so i think this suggests there's like a lot of support for ai safety research whereas a few years ago i think ai safety was considered a pretty uh, out there concern yeah so uh, a lot of people think that um it's too early to do anything like e- even though these issues are important it's premature to, to start working on them did, did they have a view about that yeah i think uh 35 percent of people thought that the value of working on the problem now, uh, sorry, this is for a narrower problem. This is for like the, the problem of aligning an AI with human values rather than any other kind of safety thing, uh, like war or something. So for that problem, 35% of people thought it was at, at least as valuable as other problems in the field of AI. So I think that's quite a bit of support for that. Yeah. Okay, so it's like a de- so it's a decent minority. <laughs> yeah, and we also asked them other things like how uh, how important the problem is and how hard it is and that sort of thing. Yeah, what um, what, what do they say about that? Forty percent of them thought that it was at least an important problem, and I guess the difficulty of the problem relative to other problems in AI. I think the most popular answer, forty two percent, was as hard as other problems in AI, and then they were kind yeah. of spread out on both sides of that. Okay. So, yeah. So overall, uh, a reasonable number think that it's like an important problem. It's not much more important than the others, uh, but neither is it less important, nor is it particularly harder, uh, nor less hard uh, <laughs> on, on balance. And people want, I guess, either about the same amount or more to, to be going into this kind of AI alignment work. Uh, something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For, for all of them, there's sort of like a decent minority thinking that it's like relatively important and valuable and yeah. hard. So there was a bunch of articles, I think, uh, a year or two ago about like whether, yeah, our machine learning research is worried about uh, AI safety. Uh, I think there was in like some technology review. We'll stick up links to these articles. But I feel like the survey, like uh, a year ago, I guess. Right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like the survey uh, reasonably kind of settles that because it's a it's a fairly representative group and they've been asked these specific questions. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have reasons to doubt whether they have uh, particularly informed views, at least about the timelines. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so perhaps they're like not giving really thought through answers to these questions either. I think the um, the question of timelines, I would expect them to do less well on than the question mm. of are these kinds of risks realistic for the technologies that they're building. Mm. Uh, like the the particular risk we described to them in uh, Stuart Russell's terms, sort of if you have a system and you give it a number of variables that it's trying to optimize and you just forget to tell it about some variables that you care about, it's it's going to do something crazy on those variables probably. Uh, and so that was the question we were asking them how hard and important it was and so on. And so I think that their expertise should be relatively good for saying like, is this a realistic problem in our field? Yeah, that makes sense. Did, did you look at the relationships between people's answers here, uh, say between the, their perception of the severity of the risks or the likelihood of the downsides and you know whether they'd like to see more resources going into into safety? Uh, we haven't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there, were, there were a huge number of questions and a huge number of interesting like comparisons yeah. between questions, and we haven't got to most of them. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, is, is the data public anywhere, or is it uh, still uh, no. still secret? <laughs> <laughs> We'd also like to make it public, but have not got up to it yet, largely okay. because we, we have like this giant data set with names of all of the questions that are just like, and we have to like interpret them into something okay. uh, before yeah. putting it up. So we are in favor. So as we mentioned earlier, uh, this was uh, a pretty popular paper, at least a widely discussed paper. How did people react to the publication, and did you end up doing a lot of media? Yeah, I guess the media reacted by emailing me a lot about uh, wanting to discuss it. As it was in New Scientist pretty early on, and I think maybe lots of people saw it from there. And this was, bef- I, I guess it's still not actually published in any journal, um, though we've been accepted in a journal and also at a conference. Um, but uh, this, it was just up on the archive, and I guess lots of journalists were interested. I think they were, they were especially interested in the um, automation of jobs aspect. Hmm. Um, and I guess also the near-term tasks. I think various people put up timelines of the different tasks and when they'd be automated. 
okay, so were they taking kind of, uh, an angle of uh, who's going to lose their job from this and like what cool things will AI be able to do in the next five years? Yeah, I think there's a fair bit of that. I think they, they, they're often interested in some of the other things as well. And there's a yeah. bunch of variety. Do you know anyone who's looked at this and been convinced that uh, like risks from artificial intelligence should be taken more seriously or there should be more funding for, for safety work? Yeah, I'm not sure about that. I think I think that people who are trying to encourage those views have found it useful to cite, but I don't know where they've got to with that. <laughs> no. uh, did you do many interviews or anything like that? Did you get on television or radio? Or <laughs> Yeah, um, I guess I, I went to Chile. Um, <laughs> uh, I was invited to their uh, Futures Congress there um, <laughs> to talk to the public of Chile about all of this. So I did that, um, and that, that involved a lot of... I think maybe the whole thing is on television. I'm not quite sure. I think I was like live on the radio in Chile talking about this, uh, which I which I didn't really expect until like five seconds before it happened. So it was fun time. And they had a translator, I guess. Uh, yeah, the, I guess the the woman doing the interview could translate. But yeah, I talked to a whole bunch of media people there, and I basically didn't know what was going on the whole time because they just expected me to know that like whatever thing in Spanish was like a magazine or something, whereas I just had no clue what's going on. Yeah. So that um, sounds like a fun adventure anyway. And, yeah. Um, actually, well, uh, one thing, uh, but before we move on from the paper, um, uh, an interesting thing that you found was that uh, machine learning researchers living in Asia, uh, had uh, they, they expected machine learning to improve much more quickly than did those living in, in North America or, or Europe. Uh, yeah. Do you have any explanation for what's going on there? I don't have any that I'm very confident in, but uh, ones I have heard are, I guess, related to this earlier story that people don't want to be too optimistic about AI, that just the norms about how optimistic to be about things may be different in uh, Asia compared to America. Mm. And uh, and in particular, that it's, you know, it's currently more fashionable in Asia, Asia to be like, yay, things are going well, we're all going to try hard and we're going to have AI soon. Right. Um, so it could be like kind of a social thing that like uh, people in North, uh, researchers in North America feel self conscious when they start giving these very boosterish yeah. uh, attitudes. They, they they worry that they might seem naive. Whereas in China, people are less so. Yeah, which might just have historical reasons. Yeah. Well, I suppose like I mean, China's been growing so quickly that perhaps they're just like more optimistic <laughs> about the future. Just across the board, they expect things yeah. to go faster. Yeah. And I guess the maybe the times that people have laughed at other people for being too optimistic maybe are mostly mm. in American culture or something. Right. It could also be that things are going well in China. Uh, oh, like, yeah, like maybe AI progress is Maybe they're noticing that like the, the, the amount of uh, research spending has been ramping up so fast there that they yeah. then expect it to go, yeah, to, to improve more quickly. I guess when you notice the, the, this clustering of views that like people from a particular group have one view, people in a different group have a different view, and these aren't like independently distributed across the groups, I guess that yeah. makes it seem less informative, I suppose. Yeah, though I think if you sort of suspected that was there was some kind of bias, then if you can actually pin down exactly what the bias is, I think it means you can make more use of the information that you have. Hmm. Like if you can, I guess earlier we looked at sort of AI researchers and um, AGI researchers specifically who are more optimistic, and you can see, okay, there's maybe like 10 years of difference between them in general. And we're like, okay, if we sort of take the average of that and, and one of them is considered right and the other one's wrong or something, we know it's like somewhere within 10 years of that. Yeah. So... Uh, let's say that you found that yeah there was a big this big difference between uh, researchers in China versus America yeah but you surveyed more Americans kind of perhaps because you you knew more Americans right uh, it's well it it starts to seem a little bit arbitrary what weighting you put on these two different groupings yeah. is that right yeah, yeah. that seems right uh, because like why would you trust the opinion of one group just based on the number of members that it has it, given that they all seem to be drawn towards the the same answer. This is right. kind of like pseudo replication that you're getting, where you ask one American and you ask another one, and basically they're, they're <laughs> all just sort of correlated. They're all correlated, perhaps because they're yeah. all reading the same things. Yeah, I mean, th- there might be some reasons you'd expect the larger groups to get it more correct or something. Like if if you're modeling them as like a whole bunch of independent uh, views of reality, but probably that's not that. Yeah, well, I get. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like uh, you do get the kind of the wisdom of crowd effects, but that might run out after a while, yeah. and then it's kind of you want this diversity of perspective, so you want to like survey people from as many different places with different knowledge as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. That's the problem. <laughs> I mean, we haven't really, we don't have a good way of dealing with it. I think. Okay, so let's push on from this specific paper, which uh, you know maybe has some wisdom in it, but uh, <laughs> but but shouldn't shouldn't completely guide our, our views, uh, and just think about what what you think, perhaps uh, over, over you know all things considered. So yeah, uh, when like do you, do you have uh, a particular view on when when you expect artificial intelligence to pati- to achieve particular competencies, or or are you just kind of very agnostic about all of this? <laughs> I'm pretty agnostic about it, actually. I guess uh, the the project of AI impacts is we sort of have an ambition to have uh, better timelines, but a lot of the things we've been working on are very low level questions, like what do hardware timelines look like or something. And I think it takes a bunch of effort to 
integrate those things into an actual good timeline, and we haven't done that step yet. So I think um, uh, to the extent that I, I personally have views on when AI will happen, they're about they're, they're sort of similarly uninformed to someone who didn't research this all the time. <laughs> I think. Uh, don't, don't tell them that. <laughs> uh, uh, so, I mean, I guess, do, do, do you see it as a, a useful research finding to have asked people who know a reasonable amount about this and just find out that they don't really have any shared view? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, as I was saying in the past, uh, it seemed pretty plausible that um, what AI researchers think is like a decent guide to what's going to happen. I think we've pretty much demonstrated that that's not the case. Uh, yeah. so, so I think there, there are a variety of different ways you might go about trying to work out what AI timelines are like uh, and talking to experts is one of them. I think we should weight that one down a lot. Probably. Mm, yeah. Um, I suppose it, it does show that no one has offered a decisive argument that artificial intelligence couldn't come fairly soon and no one's offered a decisive argument that it will true. either way. <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess it should just uh, yeah, cause all of us to be a bit more agnostic. Um, yeah, I think uh, a lot of agnosticism is probably reasonable at this point. I think even if um, people give very inconsistent answers with different framings of the question i might expect that if it was very soon that they would start to their see, yeah, answers right. would start to get in line and be very soon or start something. to converge so i right. probably still interpret it as like some evidence against that okay yeah that is coming in the next decade or something like that yeah are there other people who you'd be interested in uh surveying in future who you think would have uh, a more informed view on these ai timelines than than this group that you surveyed last time i guess natural uh alternate experts to talk to would be experts in forecasting or tech history mm. instead of AI per se. I'm not sure um, if I'm more optimistic about that. It seems like if yeah, it, might, it might be possible to do some sort of combined thing where we have like some AI people who also know something about the sort of forecasting literature or something and do some more in-depth. Uh, yeah. Could you bring them together in the same process. room and get them to talk a whole bunch and like share <laughs> what they know? Like that, yeah. yeah. Um, I think at, at this point, I feel less optimistic about the sort of asking experts to think about it things. I, I think if if someone wanted to think about it a lot, I think there are a lot of empirical facts that it would be good for them to have. And I, I feel like it's more promising to collect those empirical things at the moment. I, I think if I recall correctly, one of the things that is known about predicting things is that experts are like not very good compared to like linear extrapolations or simple models, things like that. Yeah. I, I think... Um, you could also read that as simple models and linear extrapolations are a great way to predict things mm. relative to talking to experts. <laughs> um, so is that kind so, of the direction that, that the research is going now is more towards yeah trying to figure out like what is the linear extrapolation model that we should be looking at? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I think we've always been more focused on that sort of thing. And I guess, yeah, this, the survey was kind of a weird thing for AI impacts to do. <laughs> Right. Well, I suppose it got a whole lot of attention. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, if we wanted a whole lot more attention, it's possible we should do another thing like that. Um, but I yeah. feel like it's not the best for, like, rapidly informing our views. Yeah. Okay, so we'll talk about these these linear extrapolation <laughs> models and, yeah, what kind of data you think uh, people should be collecting in just one second. But mm. uh, do you know whether super forecasters of the, the, the kind that the Tetlock has been working with to, to forecast international relations events have ever been asked about these these questions? I think that maybe someone is working on that happening, hmm. um, but I don't know the details. Okay. Well, I'll see if I can find out and, and put up a link to that uh, okay. if, if it turns out that someone is. All right. So let's uh, talk now about some of the other work that uh, AI Impacts has been doing. What other questions you've been asking in order to try to collect data that would actually allow you or like anyone to have an informed view about uh, how, how quickly we should expect AI to progress. Yeah. What is, what, what, what is the research agenda there? Uh, so in the past, we've tried to figure out exactly what the, the rate of hardware progress is, so how quickly hardware is getting cheaper, uh, which is a nice thing to try and forecast because it's sort of famously pretty straight. Like for a long time, Moore's Law was going, um, and, and I guess there are a bunch of related Moore's Laws. So in particular, the price for compute performance has been fairly predictable year after year for like many decades. And I think like on, on a scale of several decades, it varies a bit, but it's like one of the more predictable things. So we've like tried to pin that down over the last few years, which is surprisingly confusing and hard to do, <laughs> given that given that it should be so straightforward. But also it's like surprisingly hard to find things on it. Like the other people keeping track of this seem to be just like a few old professors who personally keep a list of different Huh. compute things in one place or something like it, it's not like an organized place to find this information uh, so so here you're trying to kind of draw a graph of like the cost per uh 
flops. Oh, right. Okay. Per, per processing <laughs> um, capacity uh, right. over time. And it's just saying like, there's not really any, you know, prestigious body that's doing this work. It's just a right. bunch of guys <laughs> on the internet. Yeah. And also I found two different guys on the internet and they both just like lost interest in 2014 or something. So this wasn't Stop <laughs> something like that. Yeah. It's kind um, of astonishing. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of other data, like you can sort of collect the data yourself. Like there are, benchmark websites and you can mm. like you can look up particular computers and find their performance and then you can find their price somewhere else but doing this i, I found that like their the apparent performance of the same computer just varies by like a factor of five over a couple of years and so like oh why is that so i wrote to the site and asked them what's up and they're like well we changed it what our benchmark means so uh huh. <laughs> maybe the chips are getting older do they tend to get slower or? no I, I mean they they just like changed the measurement. They changed the measurement by okay, like right. a factor of five. Wow! Like this is a different benchmarking site that we found. It looks like something similar kind of happened. Yeah, I guess there are a bunch of data sets that are all confusing in some way or another. Right. Um, and so we've sort of done a bit of this. It, it's uh, it still seems quite confusing to me. So that's one thing. Mm. <laughs> Another area that's related is trying to work out how much computing hardware you need to do something like what the human brain is doing. Okay. Like trying to somehow equate the human brain to a pile of hardware. And say, at what point would they be able to do the same number of calculations? Something like that, yeah. If you wanted to run something like doing what a human brain is doing on computers, how much compute would you need for that? And so I guess the past estimates for that that we could find varied by like 10 orders of magnitude or something like that. Um, so it's it's a tricky question. 10 orders of, okay. Yeah. Hold on. <laughs> uh, so that's like by a factor of a billion? Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So this is, I think, partly because it, we don't really know what compute is in the brain. <laughs> if, if we understood in detail what's happening there, we would be further on AI. So this is kind of, uh, so how many calculations you think are going on in the brain depends on, I guess, where you think the relevant calculations are happening. Is it happening yeah. in, like, in the neurons? Is there something complex going on inside there? Or is it just the transmission of messages between, yeah, between them? Just like what happening in the brain is a calculation even. <laughs> um, right. Because uh, it doesn't look like a transistor. <laughs> right. So we did this alternative thing and decided to just not think about computations at all mm. and instead measure it in terms of communication, so like sending messages around in the brain. Mm. So for big computers, sending the messages around is a bottleneck for like doing the computation. Even if you have like lots of bits of computer that can do really fast computation, you can't send the messages back and forth fast enough. So people made up a, a new benchmark for measuring that. And so uh, that's easier to compare to the brain. So that's what we've done because we can at least you know count the messages going around in the brain and maybe there's some uncertainty about like how much information there is in a message or something like that uh, but you can <laughs> you can have a better idea than 10 orders of magnitude right okay that's very <laughs> cool so uh okay so you're trying to compare the number of signals moving between neurons in the brain to the flow of information between different parts of a computer processor yeah okay uh yeah <laughs> what, what, what does that turn up uh well it won't mean very much probably but uh, we estimate that the human brain performs between like 0.18 and 6.4 times 10 to the 14 traversed edges per second, uh, which is uh, something like an existing supercomputer. Okay, <laughs> hold on. Like the, the biggest supercomputers or something. Okay, so a human brain, very approximately, you're guessing, very basically, yeah. is something like the biggest supercomputer that we have now. Something like that. And is, what is a tra traversed edge? This is the benchmark for, for measuring computation. So I think the, the way that the benchmark works for computers is that the computer imagines a giant graph of nodes that are connected by edges, okay. so like dots with lines between them. And the question is, how fast can it send a thing along all of the edges in the graph? Hmm. Or something like that. I'll stick up a link to that. Uh, yeah, let's, <laughs> let's not dive into that too much. But uh, so the so bottom line conclusion was that uh, we now kind of have the, have the hardware that could run a human brain. Possibly. Yeah, something like that, yeah. um, with much uncertainty around it. And then you can sort of put these things together and say, like, uh, if computing costs are coming down, then at some rate, and we know what that rate is, and we know sort of how much computing power you need for a human brain, we can ask uh, when uh, a human brain's worth of computing power will sort of be a similar price to a human. Okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> Where's <then> that? <laughs> somewhere between in the past and in the near future, like, we're actually kind of near the... The point, I think. Oh, and, well, how are you assessing the, the cost of a human? I think we're treating the cost as something like $100 an hour or something, for at, like the price of paying an expensive human or something. So, so we're saying like when, like supposing that the software was mm. just easy, when would running a human brain cost about cost the same about as the same running as a supercomputer? Right. And you're thinking a supercomputer costs something like $100 an hour, or, or at least uh, oh. it's, it's, not, it's not orders of magnitude off. Okay, so uh, I think 
This, this might be one to two years out of date. Supercomputers seem to cost clicks, somewhere between $2,000 and $40,000 an hour to run. Mm-hmm. Uh, and our estimate for the current cost of running a human brain's worth of hardware is like about $5,000 to $200,000. An hour? An hour. Okay, right. So so we're some way off, but I guess it's not. It's something that you could imagine. That you can imagine that they're the same cost in like in a couple of decades. Right. I mean, yeah, hardware prices change quickly. So uh, we we estimated that there's like a 30% chance that we're actually already past human level hardware. Oh, and this is like all of the uncertainty about human brains and stuff. I see. Because because it could be that the human brain is doing far fewer calculations than what you thought. Right. Uh, So I think this is like an interesting update uh, because, I mean, probably having AI or having human level AI depends on software as well as hardware. But I think we don't have a good idea of how important the hardware and the software are relative to each other. And many people, I think, think that hardware is a much bigger deal and that basically once we have enough hardware, uh, Mm. everything else will kind of go smoothly. Okay, so there's some people who think that the limiting factor is how many processes uh, we can make and how fast we can make them run. And there's other people who think, no, that's that's not the main issue. The problem is that the software that we have currently just like isn't doing the things that, that allow you to have a general intelligence. Something like that, except that I think like probably everyone agrees that both are somewhat important. And the question is like how they trade off against one another or something. And I guess this is an update in favor of thinking that it's about software rather than hardware, because it seems like we already have quite a lot of hardware. Right. Yeah, I think this should cause you to somewhat think we're in the software is important world Mm. and somewhat cause you to think that if we're in the hardware is important world, things are going to happen soon. Mm. Okay, so this raises the question of how quickly the processing capacity that is being applied to solving these machine learning problems has been been increasing over time. And I saw that you're involved in a a blog post that OpenAI put out uh, that was dealing with this question. So yeah, how, how quickly is the processing capacity being thrown at machine learning increasing? Yeah, um... I don't know about overall how much is being thrown at it, um, but uh, this blog post looked at how much is being thrown at like training particular things, like the sort of headline paper is how much computers use for training mm. one thing. And uh, I guess the answer was uh, it's doubling every 3.5 months, which is pretty fast. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> did I see it was something like a 300,000 fold increase over the last seven years? Uh, yep. Okay. Oh, maybe six years? <laughs> yeah, since 2012. Six years. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, an astonishingly rapid increase. Is yeah. that because there's like changes in the designs of the chips or they're just spending a ton more money uh, buying them? Do you have any sense of what's driving it? I mean, I think it's not the chips getting cheaper. So I think they must be spending a lot more on it. Uh, whether that's the sort of underlying thing that's driving it or whether it's that they're sort of more able to make use of more compute or something, I, I'm not quite sure. But I think this does mean that, uh, like, in the earlier model I was describing, we were talking about when we're going to have human level at a human cost is mm. probably not, like, it's, like, somewhat of an indicator of what you might expect, but it's not exactly what you'd expect because people are paying very different amounts of money for things, and you might expect that people will try to do this when it's much more expensive than running a human level thing at human cost. I guess what I'm saying is, if you're wondering when there will be sort of human level AI in the sense of, AI that is able to do what a human does Mm. or something, but you don't care at what price it happens. Uh, You might expect that someone is willing to do that when it's very expensive. I see. Because it will be such an achievement. Right. See, So you might be able to do it once for like, you might be able to get the equivalent of one brain if you're willing to spend a billion dollars on it. And someone would be motivated to spend that much. Right. And like, maybe that's part of what happens on the way to making it cheaper. Interesting. Uh, And... I guess then the rate of progress goes back to, you know, how much are we willing to just build more and more of these chips and also, you know, how quickly is Moore's law progressing or how, how quickly are the chips getting better? I've heard that there's like, that there's different kinds of chips, right? That, that you can run these machine learning algorithms on. So you've got like a normal CPU, which basically people don't use anymore. And you've got these graphics processing units that are much more efficient at doing the particular calculations that are relevant. You've got these tensor processing units that Google's developed. Do you want to, do you want to clarify any of that for the audience? Cause, cause I'm a little bit confused about it. Uh, all of that sounded correct. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think in general things can be like more or less well suited to particular applications. So I guess uh, there is some hope of having much more efficient processors soon, and I think they they would be just like better suited to the particular applications. I think recently there have been like some things. Uh, I guess some GPUs, for instance, can can do a lot. In general, things can do like like double precision or single precision or half precision operations. Is this uh, where, where you have like a greater error tolerance? It's to do with like how many decimal places 
each sort of number that's being moved around. Okay. Has, I think. Uh, and I think you can do like deep learning with half precision often, yeah. which means that you can do deep learning much more efficiently than than you might have thought if you can have chips that that uh, can do half precision. Okay, so each each calculation kind of close enough is good enough. Uh, it it yeah. comes out in the wash in the broader picture. So they so they just kind of each calculation is slightly half asked, but overall it works out fine. Uh, that's my understanding. But I guess this means that like like some some chips can now be like very efficient at doing deep mm. learning. So. Uh, if you were if you were measuring the same thing over time, you mightn't have seen like fast progress. But there starts being some new thing that was much cheaper at some point. But they switch onto a different class, and then that's yes, maybe so they get a bit like of a jump, and then it improves a bit more quickly. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so that was uh, two different things that you've been looking at. I guess uh, you know uh, how uh, what amount of hardware is equivalent to a human brain, and how quickly is the hardware improving? Uh, are there any other questions that uh, AI Impacts has looked at over the last few years, or plans to look at in the coming mm-hmm. years? Uh, yeah, many. <laughs> um, I guess in the past, there's been a class of things to do with how likely discontinuity is in AI progress. So, like, how likely it is that there'll be some sort of sudden jump in capability, where I think many people expect something like that, that that maybe one day someone will, like, discover the algorithm for intelligence or something, or, yeah. uh, or maybe there'll be an intelligence explosion that will be very fast. Um, but, like, we won't really be expecting it, and then someday there'll be very good AI, and then maybe it's game over yeah. or something. Uh, it'll take over the world. So we've previously looked into like just the base rate of any technology having mm. a discontinuity in it that's pretty big. So you're just saying like out of lots of technologies that we've had in, in the past, how often have they, have they had some sudden takeoff? Right, yeah. Or like, sudden jump. Yeah, yeah. where I guess uh, my impression was that it's like relatively rare, and I think that's that's been basically what we've found that we haven't like really finished that investigation <laughs> instead of going on gradually but we've so far just been like collecting cases that were big jumps i see um, and yeah. we know of like four of them okay yeah what, what are they <laughs> uh well the biggest one ever is uh, nuclear weapons as a discontinuity in explosive power per like, gram of material mm. so i guess over thousands of years or something the explosiveness of different explosives increased by like not that many times and then within like a few years it got like thousands of times better or something interesting and i guess that's because you have you've started harnessing a totally different kind of energy or a totally different source of explosive power uh, so you've gone from zero to one and it's just a totally different kind of product yeah i think uh so we're also interested in like what do such things have in common because mm. often when people think that there will be a discontinuity in ai progress they implicitly have some theory about it like yeah. because it's sort of like an algorithm and maybe it's likely to be a very simple one or something so we can say okay are things that are algorithms more likely to undergo fast progress so we usually measure these things in terms of like how long would it have taken to have this amount of progress at the usual rates uh nuclear weapons were six thousand years of previous <laughs> rates in like one go so that's big but the next biggest one we could find was high temperature superconductors uh, where they underwent maybe like a hundred years of previous progress. Yeah. So I think this was people sort of discovering different materials that could be superconductors. Um, and they hadn't really realized that there was a whole different class of things that could be superconductors. Yeah. And I think they might have like sort of had some theory that ruled it out. And then they came across this class and suddenly things went very fast. So I think it's interesting that both of these are sort of like discovering a new thing in nature. Right. Um, a yeah. new material. Yeah, basically. pretty much. Yeah. Um, and then there are, couple of other ones that are like more than 10 years one is like jet propelled vehicles uh, so the land speed record was going up with sort of more normal cars i think and then at some point jet propelled cars uh, someone just stuck a rocket on the back of a car right <laughs> <laughs> if i remember right they may have done that a few times before it like really beat them I-, I think it was sort of like there were two curves where one of them was going up slowly and then the rocket one was going up quite fast and it like yeah. went past the other one quickly. okay and the other one is airplanes. And then we also have like maybe 30 other things that people have suggested to us are discontinuous and we haven't finished looking into. Okay. Yeah, so this, yeah we, had a, uh, we had a bounty out for suggestions. I think maybe many of these suggestions don't look great, but I think some of them are probably good. So I expect right. to, I don't know, maybe find like another 10 or something. Okay. Um, Seems like discontinuities are rare, but not exceedingly rare. They, they do sometimes like happen when you get a different material or a totally different approach to, to dealing with a question. Yeah. Which I suppose... 
if what matters is just improving hardware, then that seems like it's going to be more incremental. Whereas if there's some right. total change in the algorithm that you're running that just like suddenly flips you onto a different kind of intelligence, then it could be much more abrupt. Though note that um, lots of things are new things to, to that level of right. newness. Like, in fact, there are new algorithms for things, like if, for many kinds of things, or yeah. you know, there have been. But typically, they're only incremental improvements, nonetheless. Uh, that's my impression, yeah. But much uncertainty about this at the moment. Uh, do, do you have a view on this issue, on this issue of whether uh, we should expect AI progress to be discontinuous or like suddenly suddenly go very quickly or not? And uh, like, do you have um, also what what are the best arguments one way or the other? Yeah, uh, I guess I've been doing a more recent project of collecting up all the arguments for this. I guess saying like, well, things don't seem to be discontinuous that much, but like other good reasons to think that AI might be especially likely to be. My own impression is that none of these arguments that are around uh, are that great. Uh, currently, though, I think some of them with like more detail could be good or something. So there, there are some that we'll probably investigate more. But my, my current impression is that there are not good arguments for it, but that many people think this. So like maybe it's right and maybe they have some good intuition or maybe I'm misunderstanding the arguments. But it's very much an open question. But the, the kinds of things that we might investigate more are like, so there's this intelligence explosion idea where... The idea is that we'll build AI that can basically work on building AI, and then that will speed up the AI progress, and then uh, then it will be even better at building AI, and basically there's a feedback loop. And I guess the argument, as I've heard it often, is sort of like, well, it'll be a feedback loop, so it's going to go crazy. And I think this argument is pretty lacking, just because there are lots of feedback loops in the world, and usually the world doesn't explode. It's <laughs> my impression. Yeah, um, okay, so you get a feedback yeah. loop, but the effect is sufficiently gradual. or like, So it takes time for the for the feedback right. to happen, yeah. and each stage it's only increasing somewhat, so it's, it it's gradual. It doesn't really say much about the rate. Mm, um, okay. Like, I mean, you might say, yeah, actually, there's already an intelligence explosion. Or, like, the economy is already, like, we're already making tools that are helping us make better tools, and we're thinking thoughts that are helping us to, like, think better thoughts and so yeah. on. And so, Which is true, yeah. I guess. It's just right. it's just yeah. fairly gradual, yeah. Right. Um, mm. And I mean, if you look at the economy over the long term, it does indeed look like it's sort of going to take yeah. off. It's yeah. It's um, just that on a human time scale, it's not so bad. <laughs> right. Uh, it seems to me that you could actually have a better idea of how fast this feedback loop is going to go because the things happening in the feedback loop are not entirely alien things that we haven't seen before. They're like research progress or, or like some amount of effort is being put into research progress and it's getting some amount of results and the results are leading to like an increase in capabilities. And so the question is just like, what happens when you make these, when you loop this back around into a loop instead of it just being like a, a one way path from people making effort to increases in capability. Uh, so, so that's the thing that uh, I'm working on at the moment. Interesting. You could have a situation, I suppose, where uh, so now now an AI is mostly just programming itself because it's better than us. Right. But getting smarter just becomes harder and harder. Or uh, so, well, once you're at this like frontier of intelligence, uh, it, it it gets progressively more in uh, difficult to find any new improvements. And so, nonetheless, it slows down. Yeah, I think uh, perhaps a, a key part of like making this more quantitative model of what an intelligence explosion could look like is like how does research effort turn into like getting results. There's research on this in general, yeah. um, and my impression, I haven't looked into it that much, but my impression is that it's sort of confusing and looks like, uh, you know, we've been putting increasingly much effort into various research things and only getting like linear outputs. Yeah, so this uh, is where, where the inputs grow exponentially, but the problem also gets harder at, at exponential rate as well. So you, you, on balance, you only get kind of a linear improvement over time. My impression is that it looks like something like that is happening, though it's like unclear exactly what's going wrong. Okay. In which case, I guess you could have so you could have an explosion in capability, but only a linear improvement overall. In well, it's just, it's interesting. I'm kind of contradicting myself there. Yeah, I think I think what would happen is that it would just make the um, the overall feedback loop fairly slow. Okay. Um, like it, I think it should still go faster than research progress currently goes. Just not uh, infinitely so. Perhaps. Okay. Um, what's the best argument against expecting uh, there to be some some abrupt discontinuity? I think the the best argument is just that there aren't usually abrupt discontinuities. Mm. So I guess I feel like the onus is on the person saying that there will be one mm. um, to come up with a good argument. And then I guess we have like this whole list of arguments where <laughs> none of them seem great, but that that's pretty debatable. And I guess I, I'm also working on debating that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah. Okay, so the outside view says it's unlikely. Something uh, like that, yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, so, so the researchers in the survey that we were talking about earlier thought that you know, uh, you know, a sudden takeoff in in, in progress in uh, artificial intelligence was a possibility, uh, but uh, seemed on balance n- not that likely. Uh, which I guess kind of matches up with your view. Yeah, that's true. Okay, uh, what other things has AI Impacts uh, looked into? Uh, I guess a, an amusing thing that uh, was related to the earlier measuring of how much hardware is in the brain is we also tried to estimate how much hardware there is in the world and how mm. fast that's increasing. I guess there's also a bunch of uncertainty around. We, f- we found someone else's estimates of how much hardware there is in the world, but as far as I could tell, this would mean that hardware was like more than all of the world's value with high probability, uh, like somewhere was- between 40% and like... 400% of, the of all of the wealth in the world. Something like that. Okay, uh, so, so you kind of rejected that one and went right, back to the drawing then, board. Well, we sort of half went back to the drawing board anyway. So <laughs> this area is sketchy. Yeah. Um, but but you can use the estimates of like how much hardware there is in the world and how much, uh, how much hardware there is in a human brain to say like, okay, in these kinds of scenarios that people talk about where like amazing hacking ability causes some project to take over like much of the world's hardware for, for AI uh, to like run their new hacking AI on or something like how much extra capability does that get you so like uh, okay. how, how many extra human brains worth of hardware are you stealing if you take all of the world's hardware okay um, which is perhaps not a, a great proxy for what would happen because it might be that like if you have you know, a hundred brains worth of hardware in one giant brain. Maybe it's like uh, unimaginably better than a hundred brains. Um, Separately. But, right. <laughs> yeah. But uh, ignoring that for now, uh, we, we calculate that you get like about a hundred or a thousand extra brains if you took all of the world's hardware at this point, which I think is um, not very many compared to, I don't know, yeah. the usual thought. Right. So, okay. So currently you get the equivalent possibly of around a thousand people all working together if you, if you grab all the hardware. Uh, which evidently is like not enough to run some enormous, like that. That's just a normal scale of not human enough organization. Not to take over the world. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> like if you wanted an extra like hundred or a thousand brains to do your AI project, building AI is not a good way to do that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> uh, so I guess there's enormous error bars around that, though. Right. Because, yeah. yeah. <laughs> at, at all the different points. Yeah. Are there any other other topics uh, that you want to uh, bring up in this kind of um, smorgasbord or <laughs> sort of sampling sampling uh, plate of projects from AI impacts? <laughs> Well, I guess that those are those are mostly past projects. I could say something about like projects um, that we're likely to do. I guess some of those are ongoing. Uh, but I think one thing I'm pretty interested in is figuring out whether we're in this hardware is very important world or like the software is more important world. And I think one way to make progress on this is to just look at like past AI progress and say like how much of the increase in capabilities that we've seen in different areas came from hardware versus software. And that's kind of easy to figure out, I think, okay. uh, in, in particular cases. And then you need to look at a lot of cases, maybe. Like, I've done a bit of this. And I guess the, the bit that I've done, it looked like maybe it was unclear. But uh, <laughs> something like 50-50 was not ruled out. Okay, so just explain this, uh, this thing to me. As I understand how machine learning works, uh, you have to throw a lot of processing power at this training process where you kind of develop, develop an algorithm that it's going to use to make decisions. But then having done that, you can you can operationalize you, you can you can run that algorithm a lot more with, with a lot less processing capacity. Is that right? That's right. Okay, so uh, if so, when you switch from like training to actually implementing, you get you can you can implement like many many uh, instantiations many of, of the many copies of it. Uh, interesting. Yeah. So kind of when when Google does you know image recognition or something for for Google Maps, it has to do this big training process, and then once it's spat out the product, then it can do it across lots of streets like a lot more easily. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, given what you've been saying so far, it seems like this whole area of forecasting AI is uh, quite undeveloped. It seems like there's, there's only a few people working on it, and uh, there's just lots yeah. of questions that you've only had you know, a couple of days really to look into that, that seem really important. Uh, that seems about right. I mean, often it takes us more than a couple of days to do what seems like it could take a couple of days, but uh, aside from <laughs> I that, I think that's true almost <laughs> everywhere. Everything but. is very underdeveloped, um, and I guess it seems to me like there are, there are lots of really tractable ways to develop it as well, and lots of things that haven't even been touched and would be great to do. Yeah, I mean, even the, the, the fact that we don't have a good record of how uh, Moore's Law has been progressing, really, or that you're having to <laughs> pull this together and that no one's even really recording the data right now is is astonishing. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
what do you think explains this? What, why, don't, why don't people care about uh, predicting? You'd think maybe, maybe even Google or some other organization would care from a you know, business point of view that they'd want to know what, when they're going to be able to do different things. Yeah, so I guess it seems plausible that there are things like that inside companies that we don't know about uh, right. or, or that there are outside companies and we just have failed to find them or something. I think overall forecasting AI seems to widely be considered like very hard and basically like pointless to try to do or something. But I, th- I think this is largely based on something like past efforts at predicting AI being considered failures. Though the, the past efforts, I think, are mostly these instances where people have just like made up numbers on a single occasion and been like, yeah, I think it's going to be 2028 or something. <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess Ray Kurzweil has put more thought into this. I think not that many other people have put that much thought into it. And so uh, I guess... I think people are using entirely the wrong standard for judging, like, is this feasible? Okay. As in, I think people have tried very little to do it, and then it's sort of unclear how well it's gone, and they've been like, oh, well, that was embarrassing, let's not do that again. But um, in reality, they've just put almost no effort in. Yeah. Um, like, I guess I like to compare to something like uh, climate change, which seems like it's probably less of a severe problem than AI risk. But if you look at, like, the amount of effort that is going into predicting what will happen with that, I think that's probably more appropriate for a problem at this scale. Right. It's also exceedingly difficult to predict. Right. Uh, similarly yeah. difficult to predict, but people have spent hundreds of millions of dollars effectively trying to do that. Right. I think yeah. on the margin, AI should be, like, much easier to, to like, start to predict. Um, yeah. Because almost nothing's been done. Right. Um, and, and there are a bunch of, like, linear extrapolations to, to look at. I, I think also uh, there's kind of, like, a, a notion that predicting things is quite hard in general. Uh, which, you know, it is in some sense. But th- there are a bunch of things that we can predict well, that we have predicted, and we sort of don't give ourselves credit for them because they're, like, easy to predict. Mm. Um, for instance, we can predict, like, what the climate in Oxford is going to be like in, like, five years, um, mm. roughly. Uh, but, like, we know that's a thing that's sort of predictable. So, yeah, usually if we're having, like, a prediction tournament or something, the things that are in the prediction tournament are things that are kind of hard to predict. Uh, I see. Whereas if... If the metric is just like, how are we doing against reality? Like, can we figure out the answers to the questions we need to know? It's like, not clear how easy or hard those questions are going to be. And so I think for, like, for some of the past AI things, it seems like it, it could have been very easy to predict them. I'm not sure to what extent people did, but like, for instance, I guess for, for most of chess AI, it was like as good as, as some human level, but when was it going to beat all of the humans? Yeah. I think you could have seen that coming from a long way off because it was just fairly incremental over decades. Okay, yeah. So you're saying people think that like uh, forecasting AI might be extremely uh, progress might be very hard, but in fact, if it's just kind of linear, which is kind of constant in a sense, uh, just like the weather in Oxford is fairly constant over a five year period, or the climate in Oxford is fairly uh, constant over a five year period, then in fact it might be fairly straightforward. You just draw out the line, and uh, I, I suppose there's a question of you know at, at what point on the line will it have particular capabilities? But uh, this gives you this could give you a pretty good idea, and no one's even done that. Yeah, I guess uh, I, I think there are probably many things that are hard to predict and that are sort of surprising and so on. But I think uh, the the bits of this that should be easy to predict that at least give you like some structure that then more complicated things might happen on top of, uh, I think we haven't really tried to do that well. So there's very hard parts and there's some easy parts and the easy parts kind of get you some part of the way there, but we haven't even taken the, the low hanging fruit. Yeah, yeah, roughly. Do you consider yourself as like having kind of colleagues who are working on this in other organizations? Is it, is it just a couple of people at AI Impacts who are doing this? <laughs> at least, at least doing it publicly. Yeah, I think there are like some other organizations who are doing like some things that are relevant to it, but I'm not sure if anyone else is like sort of full time dedicated to forecasting AI. Yeah, I guess like Future of Humanity Institute uh, does some things related to this, it's like AI strategy type things. I mean, OpenPhil is looking for someone to do AI forecasting, I think. And there are various AI organizations who might have something like this going on, or like some some such things, <laughs> or, or people who are doing a mixture of things to do with like making AI go well, where some of them are AI forecasting related. Okay, so what originally motivated you to work on you know, positively shaping the development of artificial intelligence in general? I think AI seems basically guaranteed to happen at, at some point. And I think it seems very likely to change the world a lot, just like every corner of the world a lot. Uh, so it, it seems like basically the, the biggest deal around. <laughs> and I think more likely than not, if we don't really do anything about this stuff with aligning it with human values, like if, if we don't cause any AI that uh, is quite powerful to care about human values, in the long run, I expect 
humans to basically lose control of everything. So, so I don't necessarily expect that there'll be like one day when AI takes over the world or something like this. I think I'm much more uncertain about a lot of the specific scenarios than maybe many people around. Uh, I don't necessarily even expect like you know very fast progress or something. But I think even if things happen very slowly, I basically expect the same problem to happen in the long run, where the, the same problem that people are concerned about often, which is the problem of AI being very powerful and very good at making decisions uh, and not having human values, so that in the long run, all of the decisions are being made not in favor of what humans want, and everything is terrible forever. But so the, the sort of slow-moving scenario that basically looks the same would be something like, I don't know, suppose you're like a company and you're maybe you're like mining coal or something and you make some AI that like cares about mining coal. Maybe it sort of knows about human values enough for like in the next 10 years or something to not do anything terrible. But overall, let's say it's like a, it's like a bunch of sort of agents who are smarter than humans and like better than humans in every way, but they just care a lot about mining coal. I expect in the long run for them to basically accrue resources and decision making, uh, like control over things and so on, because they're basically better than us in every way. And in the long run, society did just move more toward just like trying to mine a lot of coal and not do anything that humans would have cared about, which you know might be fine if they're the right kind of creatures who really like, who really get a lot of pleasure from the coal mining or something. They like um, coal for the right reasons. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, but you might also imagine that they're like not even you know conscious or anything, but. Yeah, the consciousness thing doesn't really matter for what will happen in the world. Like, they might still be very good at, like, taking control of things. I guess it seems similar to, like, what happened with, say, pre-human, like, you know, chimp-like uh, species and so on. If they had a choice to, like, start off humans existing, it seems like it was probably a bad idea for them. Even if they could maybe kill a particular human or something, like, they quickly lost control of the situation because we were just, like, better at everything. Okay, so given that uh, very few people have been working on this, it would be valuable, I guess, to get more people to actually spend some time trying to uh, trying to do this forecasting work that is fairly untouched. How can people potentially work on this? So, well, what steps should they take if there's a listener who thinks, you know, uh, I, I, should, I could be doing this, I'd, I'd like to contribute? Yeah, I think um, we've published some lists online of uh, concrete projects that we think people could do. I guess we've also marked ones that we think people could maybe do, like, on their own, basically, if they want to like try this kind of thing, if people want to try things like that and then like send us their efforts, we're happy to like talk to them about uh, whether they've done well or not, or whether they should be getting some more particular expertise. One thing that's sort of unusual about this field is that there are really a bunch of different areas covered. Like sometimes we're trying to figure out what happened with nuclear weapons or some historical thing or like AI hardware or like brains of monkeys, and so. I think people with quite a range of different areas of expertise probably could find useful things to do here. And I think often there are fairly modular projects where you can do a small amount of effort and hopefully get some output. So so I think I would recommend sort of trying it quite early on and seeing how it goes uh, before, for instance, like going off to get a PhD or something. Um, but this yeah. might be my idiosyncratic uh, <laughs> lack of desire for stability or something. Yeah, okay. So you see so you think a reasonable path in is just looking at interesting questions and then trying to actually tackle them that you don't necessarily need to have a ton of training uh, or like not more training than like many listeners would already have. And you don't need to have any particular access either. You can just actually do these things from home if you have the gumption to, to follow through. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's my impression. I mean, I think that's sort of what I have done to a large extent. And yeah, I think a lot of them you don't really need much other than the internet. And I mean, I think you probably need some, um, I think there are probably things you need that are hard for me to see. For instance, yeah. if, if you, suppose you have a sort of high level question, like how important is hardware relative to software? Uh, I think there's a sort of mental skill of being able to work out how to answer that. That seems maybe relatively rare. Uh, or like, that's a thing that I think people have had problems with. So if you are happy to just sort of for someone else to work out what a good low-level project to do and then do those, maybe that's fine. It's not so bad, um, yeah. I guess, do you feel like people need, or if they're trying to do this research independently, that the main thing they're going to lack is people to talk to who have an interest and knowledge about this to give them, just just clue them into the, like, the basic knowledge that they need and to keep them motivated, perhaps? Uh, yeah, that seems probably true. I think many people have trouble working on their own. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think... If people are interested in working on this kind of thing and like working on it on their own for a bit is going well, uh, you know, they should get in touch with us because we're trying to hire people. Right. Um, yeah. And I guess there are other places who are also looking to hire 
people to do this kind of thing, um, though they might be. I, I guess we're we're happy to have people come for like like a couple of months or something and see if it goes well. Other people might be less into that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, what kinds of people would you be like most interested in hiring? What would be the ideal candidate to walk through the door, <laughs> or kind of a couple of different archetypal candidates? So I think like being comfortable with a wide range of different research areas somewhat, like being able to jump in and out of, uh, like to be thinking about hardware one moment and chimpanzees another moment is uh, useful. Uh, I'm not quite sure how rare that is, but I guess, yeah. I think somewhat rare in academia, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Overall things that make people good researchers in general, I think, general research skills. Yeah, this this thing I mentioned of sort of being able to, I guess, sort of, be a bit like a detective or something and like get a weird open-ended question and like figure out which other things in the world would give you evidence about that yeah Uh, to to not be demoralized if it's not obvious what the path forward is right and if like you just googled what the path forward was and you didn't find it (laughs) to like (laughs) uh, be able to like think about it on your own and i guess do that well like some some people might not be demoralized but they might also not do it well (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah um yeah, I think I could be wrong about what the most important things are. I haven't hired that many people in the past. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. But uh, so you didn't mention kind of what major or what like background training people have or <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what, what knowledge they have. Is that, yeah. is that not maybe as important as people expect? I mean, I do think that uh, sort of general ability to like read something you're unfamiliar with and think about it is probably more important. Being familiar with any one of these fields that's relevant is is good, but it seems like you're likely to spend a bunch of time in areas that you don't know that much about. Um, so, there's, so there's no one who really has expertise in all of the areas. So as long as you know right. something about one of them, then you're as like well placed as kind of anyone going in. Yeah. And I guess if a lot of expertise on one topic is important, we hope to sort of like interview people or something who know about that. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that said, like expertise on one of the things would be good, but it, yeah. it's probably not like a main thing that we're looking for. Uh, so what in your experience is kind of the, the biggest barriers for people who want to get involved in this or, or that, that stop people from getting involved in it? My guess is that not many people get involved in it in part because it's like not clear how to get into it. I think I got into it via sort of unconventional method of thinking it was worth doing and then hoping that people would give me money for it and then people magically appearing and giving me money for it. But I think, you know, <laughs> many people would not do that. Yeah, and it's like not an obvious path. Like there wasn't sort of someone there being like, "Oh, would you like to take the uh, make AI impacts option here?" Right. Okay. So you kind of had to start the thing, and then people uh, were like, "Oh, this is kind of cool." So we're happy to fund this. But you, right. you took the initial risk. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Why is it that like paths here? Well, they, they seem, it seems like there are no conventional paths. I mean, what, why why couldn't someone try to do this as a PhD topic, for example, and then they kind of keep their options perhaps a bit more open? Yeah, I think uh, I think they could do that. My impression is that you can improve your understanding of an area relatively quickly. So I guess I would be hesitant to spend like you know three years on a project when uh, you could spend like two weeks and have a, a rough idea and then get onto the next two week long project or something. Um, I see. But, but that's more of like uh, that's partly because my goal is to like try and improve mm. my understanding of a broad range of things quickly. But I think if uh, if you were interested in like making sure that you sort of had that uh, you know, PhD to fall back on and, and I, I guess got a bunch of research experience like that, yeah. that could easily be a good thing to do. So your concern is that someone in a PhD would be required to look into things in an excessive amount of depth, uh, relative, <laughs> like given just the practical outcomes that you're trying to create? Something like that, yeah. Um, so I think there, there are many projects where you could look into them in into lots of depth for yeah. three years. and um, How smart is a pigeon? Okay. For instance. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, I think there are pr- probably... Know, high level ones that you could do that and, and i think that would be very valuable so i think like you know if you're keen to do a phd i think there's there are lots of things here that you could do a phd on that would be a good idea yeah do you, do you have a list of those anywhere or i suppose I have, there's, there's just the questions on uh, <laughs> on the ai impact site that you think people should look into yeah um i guess we have a much longer list of questions that i haven't got around to putting up but we have a short list uh on the, on the site at the moment and i guess if uh if people are doing phds in particular areas and want advice on like which questions we know about that might be in that area i'm sort of happy to you know yeah. field emails on that yeah Kaja's not hard to find just google her name okay. <laughs> Kaja grace and then you'll get her email what do you think listeners uh would be most likely to misunderstand about the work that you do or this entire field of inquiry um i think the the misunderstanding that i most come across is uh, just about like how 
tractable this kind of thing is like i think people are often like oh this has been like a whole person for several years doing this is it is the field basically like is it running out of things to do or something? <laughs> <laughs> is there still anything to make progress on um which just seems like a very radical understanding of the situation yeah why do you think that is what, what do you think is biasing people towards feeling that something that it sounds like is exceedingly neglected is is, is not so because, I mean, there's been quite an explosion in people going into AI technical safety work. Uh, and people don't think that, oh, well, there's like one person who's looked into it for a few years, so it's full. Uh, not by any means, but on, but on this day, they feel more that way. Yeah, I'm sort of confused about that. I think, I feel like somehow people use different meanings of like hard or something. Like they're like, well, we did this and it was kind of hard. And so we shouldn't do that anymore. Let us try to build an AI that will take over the world. <laughs> <laughs> that also sounds hard, but maybe, maybe worth it. I don't know. Yeah, is it maybe? Okay, I suppose this is an extent to which this is kind of a social science issue that feels like a bit less technical, a bit less mathematical, and perhaps yeah. given that the people that are drawn to this are just like more rigorously technical computer science people, they see paths forward on the technical stuff, but not on this. Yeah, that might be right. Um, and I guess maybe in general, society has made more progress on very technical things than social things. Like you know, mm. we've managed to go to the moon, we've managed to like stop war, so maybe. Uh, I mean, oh, general well, yeah. social science things seem like more of a mess. I wonder if uh, Philip Tetlock's work showing that expert judgment uh, or ex- expert forecasts weren't that reliable, which is very well known, I think, in this community, also perhaps discouraged people a bit. Yeah, I think I think that's really right. I mean, I think there are sort of you know, general, like, uh, uh, summarized ideas that are like, you know, prediction is hard, AI prediction is ridiculous, um, <laughs> like, hard and also goes badly. I don't know, we've chatted about this in many conversations over the years, probably with like... And yet we haven't answered it. <laughs> right. Is it surprising that there isn't kind of an academic discipline or that some people in academia have just realized that this is kind of the thing that they should be doing, that this is their calling? Or it, I, mean, I suppose maybe there's just a lot of gaps in academia, so we shouldn't be too surprised if this one happens to be one of them. Yeah, I think that doesn't seem too surprising to me. I mean, I think probably forecasting technology in general seems like a fairly small area i think yeah do you see any paths of people who want to work on this question but want to do it in like a prestigious uh, safe way other th- other than maybe doing a phd um i mean i think there are various organizations who are probably looking for like you know at least one person to be working on things like this like i would imagine various ai organizations would right? be interested to have at least like one person trying to predict yeah how quickly they'll go or maybe yeah, I guess if you like know them, you happen. could. Yeah, I guess if if you know them, you could meet them and try to convince them that it's worth funding. Uh, but right. not that many people have direct contacts already. Yeah. What kind of events are you and other people who are interested in this question likely to be found out if people want to come and come and meet you <laughs> and uh, I don't know t- test out whether they whether they want to join in. Occasionally, we run workshops and that sort of thing, uh, like discussing particular questions. Like I guess we had one before that was like trying to come up with questions to do with what are called multipolar scenarios, like where there are lots of different AIs or, or lots of different parties in general and, and things didn't get very um, uh, unified in, in whatever kind of AI transition happened. Uh, so, so we had a, a, an event where a, a bunch of people vaguely interested in this kind of thing came together and thought about research projects that would shed light on that. So I guess if you want to be invited to things like that, if they happen, you can also email me. Yeah, uh, There are occasionally go to conferences or something like that, but... There are a lot of conferences in the world. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you go to the AI conferences? Or I guess sometimes you go to EA Global, right? That's true. Yeah. yeah. This year I'm going to miss it, but usually I go to EA Global. Uh, this year I'm going to go to an AI con- conference, but, but usually I haven't been to any AI conferences. Okay. So people shouldn't just expect you to be there, but, but they can email. And, uh, Unless this one goes really well. <laughs> they try to meet. <laughs> Let's talk a bit more about uh, your your personal background. What do you think in, in your background has prepared you to do this? And uh, was the training relevant? Or do you, do you think you would have just been better off starting it uh, many years before you did? I think that the, the sort of formal education I've done doesn't seem to have been re- very relevant, except, I don't know, like high school math and that sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> and so, so I don't think it really matters what I did there. But I think also if I had started such things much earlier... I imagine them going less well, <laughs> right? I think probably a lot of the differences from talking to people oh. and I guess coming into contact with a lot of the other research work that's happened in this area, which probably wasn't through formal education channels, but I guess like I've been visiting FHI every now and again for years and uh, chatting to people in Berkeley about who are interested in this kind of thing. 
So you started your PhD, but decided uh, not not to continue it. <laughs> yeah. Was that because it just didn't seem relevant to, to this question that you thought was the most important thing for you to be working on? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess it, maybe somewhat. It, it was. I didn't have a particular question that I thought was most important to be working on. I, I did want to be working on something to do with like saving the world broadly, <laughs> like reducing existential risk, that sort of thing. So I, I was hoping to work somewhere like at FHI or the Future of Humanity Institute or something like that. And uh, I had the impression that you needed a PhD for that from like my prior efforts to get hired by such places. And so I, I think partly uh, I had an opportunity to, to do that kind of work anyway. And so have, getting the PhD didn't seem so useful. And the work during the PhD didn't seem so useful and also I was really hating it. <laughs> uh, why, why were you hating it? Uh, I, I just had really bad anxiety disorder so it was um, uh, sort of not that related to the PhD in particular um, but I was I guess I was living in Pittsburgh and I, I don't know I just I had like did- panic attacks all of the time <laughs> and uh, but when I was in California I wasn't having panic attacks all of the time so I thought why not be in California? Yeah <laughs> <laughs> that makes that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, I guess maybe because you had more friends here, it's just like a more pleasant environment. Did yeah, you- I, think, I think some things like that. I I basically didn't know anyone that well in Pittsburgh, so uh, I guess <laughs> I think I, I really didn't like having to be in classes. I think like philosophy classes in particular <laughs> seemed particularly likely to make me have a panic attack, and yeah. Berkeley just didn't involve any philosophy classes at all. Whereas my PhD was pretty insistent on the going to philosophy <laughs> classes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, it's I'm, an idiosyncratic I'm, problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, it's so unpleasant, for that, but I guess it, it led you in the right direction, probably in the end. Uh, yeah, I think um, I think if it if it hadn't, I hopefully would have tried harder and gone back. Uh, but it, it turned out to pretty quickly seem to be much more promising. So uh, to leave, yeah. yeah. Did, did you have a lot of resistance to leaving the PhD because you felt it would? Uh, well, it's just like kind of closing a door on a particular path, and people can often be pretty reluctant to, to do that kind of thing. I think by the time I left, I was, I was fairly keen to leave. Though uh, I think it was probably easier because my program was uh, very open to me coming back later. They sort of said, uh, we'll probably throw away your paperwork in 10 years or something, uh, <laughs> at which point it will become more awkward for you to return. <laughs> but it didn't seem that much like I was forever cutting off the possibility. Yeah. And you already, I guess you had a project to kind of go to in California, so you right. should do that. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I usually have a bunch of projects that seem more exciting than any particular um, university course I could be taking. <laughs> okay, so we've talked about some things that you've done that you don't think are really helped you to, to succeed in the, in the path that you're on now. But what are some things that, you, that you've done over the years that you think really were worth the, the, the time and effort? So as I was saying, I think um, meeting people and, and talking to a bunch of different people who are interested in similar things has been quite useful. I think in particular... Uh, in the effective altruism community and the rationalist community, sort of related to the AI safety community. Yeah, I had like a, a lot of good discussions over like <laughs> the decade and a half or something. I think I've been uh, pretty willing to like move around and, you know, move to the other side of the world and then <laughs> the, the drop of a hat because it seemed good or something. I don't know if that goes well for people in general, but I feel like it's worked out well for me. Probably doing, um, I, I said that like, the, the courses I've done and so on haven't seemed that useful. Uh, I did do this honors year project on anthropics uh, with David Chalmers, and that seemed pretty good, I think. Uh, as like mostly, it just involved me hanging out by myself for a year and thinking about stuff. But it seemed like good practice doing that and having someone good check whether it's going well or not, <laughs> whether you're thinking it's right or not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing that I thought you might say is uh, you've uh, blogged online for a long time, I think, since maybe oh, yeah, 2008, 2009. Yeah. And uh, like one thing that seemed unusual about you is that you're actually just willing to like investigate questions and try to answer them. And I wonder whether that mentality <laughs> somewhat comes from the fact that you've just been writing up things that you think and things that you've learned about uh, for a long time. And so you, you already kind of have this research process going on all the time. And it's just a matter of like turning it towards like a, a particular focus and then writing those things up. Yeah, I think that seems true. My guess is that both of them stem from some like underlying difference in perspective. I'm not quite mm-hmm. sure what causes that. Yeah. I think uh, insatiable curiosity, <laughs> not just I, I like incredible I'm, intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's. Uh, I don't think I'm insatiably curious. It, it might be. Um, I don't know. I guess. I feel like one thing that maybe changed my perspectives on things somewhat were like when I was a kid, I read various books about philosophy that were sort of like 
you might be a kid and be curious about things and try to like and think the world is really strange and crazy and there are like these things you should try and figure out and then as you grow older you'll like sink down into society and just care about whether you have like a job and stuff and whether you're going to have a good funeral or something uh, <laughs> don't do that kids uh, <laughs> r- remain uh, remain uh, impassioned by um, how, the how strange questions. the world. Yeah, the big picture questions. And I think uh, I think that probably <laughs> I, I was a bit like, well, yeah, that sounds dangerous. Um, and I, feel like, I feel like that's just stuck in the back of my mind a bit. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I don't know how much that actually affects things. I know there's some machine learning researchers uh, in in the audience. If some of them were were really interested in what you've been saying, uh, would it be useful for them to potentially spend some or even all of their time uh, doing this kind of work? Uh, so I think if uh, if someone had a good understanding of machine learning and was interested in this kind of thing, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions that would be uh, they'd be in a particularly good position to work on. How does that compare with uh, the value of doing kind of AI sa- technical AI safety research? Do you have a view on whether people can make a greater contribution doing one versus the other? I guess my my tentative view is that I should be trying to work on this rather than AI safety type stuff. I don't have a very strong view. I, I guess my my overall take is that like. This kind of stuff is just so neglected, whereas there are quite a few people working on technical AI safety. Uh, and I guess, yeah, this this also seems just like very tractable. I think technical AI safety, it seems like it probably needs to be done at some point. So maybe that's like some argument for doing it. Mm. Uh, there, there I think... Whereas maybe we could get away without doing what you're doing. Yeah. But I think then we're sort of hoping to get lucky somewhat in that. Mm. I, I think that I think of the overall thing as like, well, there's like a, there's a big problem that we're coming up upon probably uh and we have a very poor understanding of what it's like it's sort of like walking down a dark tunnel and we know that there's maybe something iffy down there but we don't know if it's like a dragon or a giant pit or Mm. what and it seems like just having a little bit more light is like very useful there that you might be like well but whatever the danger is down the tunnel if we just had like more intelligence that would be good or something like maybe there are some things that you definitely know you're going to need but i but i think it's I think it's easy to sort of be too enthusiastic about the, the AI safety over, other, over things that help you strategize more. Uh, oh. I think often like doing the AI safety research, like if, if you thought that it was going to be quite a way off, doing the AI safety research now might be like a bad idea relative to other things you could do to make the situation better, I think. Okay, before we move on, is there any kind of final advice you want to give to people? Uh, I think if you're interested in doing this kind of research, a, a good place to start, uh, like on the sort of maybe two hour level of getting started is like, ask yourself what you actually think about what will happen with AI. Uh, and if you can, why you think that and what would maybe change your views about it yeah. and try and sort of come up with a consistent picture that you endorse uh, and, and see which things are really open questions for you in the hope that you can find things that you're very curious about. Uh, I guess that there's a whole lot of information that people can read on the AI Impacts website as well. You've uh, right. kind of built this like mini encyclopedia of uh, yeah the work that you've done on, on these on these questions, which would uh, definitely help to get people off the ground. Uh, yep, that's true. <laughs> so, uh, AIimpacts.org, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Speaking of trying to figure out what your views actually are, <laughs> let's talk now a bit about your like overall view of the AI safety landscape, uh, how you think things are going, how you think things are going to go in the, in the future. Accepting at the outset that uh, kind of no one knows all that much what we want to like find out kind of what what your view is so we can add that to the pool of, of, of everyone's opinions sure um yeah what about uh ai today like uh most excites you what did you did you see any positive signs that the that the future's going to get better than maybe you thought five years ago well five years ago uh ai risk in general is a pretty obscure concern i think mm-hmm. uh, and it looked like maybe it was just going to be a, a very small number of people outside of ai who were worried about it was that five years ago probably um, and I think in recent years, it's become like a much more mainstream issue, which I think is very promising. Uh, I guess in some ways it's not promising because you might think, well, uh, if it seems like an obscure problem, that might just be that we are wrong. <laughs> it's really uh, a stupid thing to be worried about. And so maybe if you find that the people who actually know about AI, many of them are like, oh yeah, that's a problem. Uh, that's bad news. But uh, supposing that you're right, then it, it's good to have the, uh, you know, a lot of people actually working on AI, yeah. th- thinking that safety is an important thing to pay attention to. Do you see any positive signs in how machine learning, uh, you know, algorithms or products are actually developing that uh, things might not be as dangerous as we thought, or that we're finding ways to make them safer? I don't think that we have that much evidence from the things we've seen about about any kind of long term problems. It seems like things are indeed pretty safe, uh, and that this is perhaps reason to not be so worried about 
AI risk. But I think that you sort of could have made that argument before. And the argument is basically like, well, for all technologies that we've ever made, if you sort of use them beyond where you've built them to, to do what you want, then something bad will happen. But we always manage to not use them in that case. Uh, like we make cars to, to go along the road. If they have a driver in them, you could be like, well, but what if you just didn't put a driver in them and just let them drive in some direction? They could go off the road, but we know that, so we don't do it. So you might think, well, if we can't manage to get AI to, to do exactly what we want, we just like won't use it in those cases. And I, I mean, I think that what we've seen so far is sort of basically in line with that, but so is the rest of having products and so on. Um, and I guess the reason for concern in the long run would be something like that we're going to err more on this, like that it's going to be harder to keep track of when you're using a thing beyond its scope for doing what you want, or that there will be incentives to do that. And I guess uh, externalities where someone is using the thing, but it's causing much worse things for someone else. So it seems like in the past, people who've been worried about um, artificial intelligence safety have mostly been worried about the scenario where AI suddenly becomes dramatically smarter than humans and has almost like godlike uh, abilities to just totally outwit us uh, at every turn and, and effectively um, very quickly will have ceded uh, control uh, to an AI that can basically run, run ramshot over us. These days, it seems like uh, there's many more people who are, who are less worried about this kind of godlike AI scenario and more worried just about a gradual seeding of influence to, uh, you know, perhaps many different uh, AI systems that each are doing you know, different partial things. And it's not so much that the AI is able to completely outwit us, but just that gradually uh, most of the functions in society would be taken over by these AI systems. Uh, where do you kind of stand on that? And do you have any view on how a uh, transition to uh, like a very AI dominated economy uh, might play out? Yeah, I think I've always found the sort of sudden godlike AI takeover scenario less likely than I think other people around, uh, mostly because I think that <laughs> that doesn't usually happen with things. And so you need a pretty, uh, pretty good positive case for thinking it will happen here. I guess it's like closely related to these uh, arguments about discontinuous progress. I, I basically feel like in order for someone to take over the world, uh, you you kind of need for that someone to have seen like quite sudden progress. Otherwise, people are going to be like just behind them. Mm. Um, like even even if you expect to have like very good AI in like five years, if in like four and a half years you had like almost very good AI, then maybe no one takes over the world because there are a bunch of people with almost very good AI. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I guess I, I'm more inclined toward the non godlike AI scenarios though given the difficulty of thinking about questions and the fact that lots of people disagree with me here, I wouldn't put that low a chance on it. And I guess, uh, as you say, views on this seem to have changed somewhat in recent years, perhaps. I think I'm not that optimistic that they've like changed based on like good arguments filtering around the place rather than sort of demographic dis differences in like who tends to think which things and who's... I mean, I think, for instance, the the field of worrying about AI has got bigger and maybe more people with more like mainstream views on things are in it. And then they'll tend to have more mainstream views on like scenarios that are likely, mm. which will be less crazy sounding scenarios. Seems like uh, a part of it, at least among people that I know is that uh, Paul Cristiano, uh, who's like a very well-respected person in this area has mm -hmm. uh, written a number of posts explaining why he thinks things will go more gradually uh, and at least that's that, that kind of I, his ideas are filtered through to people who I know, and I think they've like softened their views at least on this intelligence explosion stuff. Yeah, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that seems plausible as a um, as yeah. a large influence, but perhaps not not in the world as a whole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you think of this argument that uh, even if it's fairly unlikely that the development of superhuman AI systems would come soon or that it would happen very abruptly uh, at, at, yeah, at, at a very quick uh, quick pace, uh, that people who are paying attention now should focus on it anyway because this is um, a scenario in which they might be able to have an, an outsized influence because they're, they're paying attention earlier and they're, well, they're a larger fraction of, of all of the people paying attention now relative to the fraction of people that they'll represent in 50 or 100 years' time. I haven't thought a huge amount about this, but on the face of it, uh, I, I'm not sure that... Uh, that in the very soon scenario, you have that much more of an outsized impact, uh, if at all, compared to the other one. Uh, it seems like in the case where, there, where it's further out and there are a bunch of people who will ever pay attention to it, um, we're still uh, among the very early people paying attention. Like in either case, there are a few people now. Um, and so 
in the longer term one, we will probably have an outsized impact on what happens with the longer term efforts. And so I'm not sure overall how much of a factor I expect between those two. I think less than people might usually expect. Do you think that uh, we should expect to have you know more influence if there's kind of discontinuous progress in AI, or if it's just uh, business as usual, or would it just be would it just be the same basically either way, or no particular reason to expect to be able to control one more than the other? I guess the discontinuous progress uh, scenario involves someone having a huge amount of influence mm. uh, and many other people losing all influence. Mm. Um, so I, I guess uh, I expect that one to be higher variance at least and uh, perhaps if we're paying more attention we're especially likely to be among the, the small number of people who have a large influence but that's a pretty abstract consideration and perhaps it depends a bit on what the what the scenarios look like so uh what's the disagreement that you have with uh people in uh, machine learning in general perhaps the, the kinds of people who filled out your survey uh, i think a key disagreement that maybe explains the differences in our behavior uh a fair bit is about whether you can do things now to affect something that's like maybe 20 years or more into the future, mm. which I guess I've studied somewhat, <laughs> though I probably still don't know that much more about it than, than them. My impression is that people very rarely try to do things that will affect something 20 years ahead that, that are not, for instance, also going to affect things much sooner mm. um, or, or that are not like very similar to past cases or something. Like people save for retirement, even though it's more than 20 years away, but you know, it's kind of analogous to past retirements that have happened. Yeah. So I think there's not much of a track record of people doing that for us to say how successful or unsuccessful it is, mm. but it does. It seems like they're right that it's not usually the done thing. Um, yeah. But my impression is that it's worth trying because it's really important. Yeah. Uh, so, you, so you don't see strong reasons to think that it's impossible, perhaps, perhaps like, they, right. like they do. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess I, I'm not even sure if they really think, if they've thought about it and think that it's impossible, or if it's just sort of like, wait, this isn't what we do. <laughs> like, like it's sort of weird to worry about overpopulation on Mars before, like, long before you've colonized Mars, for instance. Yeah. Um, but it's like not, it's not obviously wrong to. Yeah. Well, especially if you're if you have like projects that are literally trying to colonize Mars, right. which basically we do right now. So, yeah. uh, well, if, yeah, if metaphorically, to, yeah. well, I mean, we have both a literal one and, and metaphorical ones in this right. case. Yeah. Are there any examples at all of people trying to kind of shape the development of a future technology? You know, a substantial period ahead of time. Yeah, I think so. Um, I actually looked into this for Mary before. And I, I looked into two case studies that seemed like they, they might have been. I had a whole list of ones that were plausible, yeah. um, but it, it's sort of uh, unclear ahead of time exactly what people were thinking and what they expected and so on. Um, so, so one that does seem like plausibly this was Leo Szilard and his efforts to, I guess, keep secret various uh, findings to do with nuclear weapons, I guess, in the 30s and early 40s, between when he realized that nuclear chain reactions were possible and when the first atom bomb was set off where I, I guess that was less than 20 years say but i think at, at the beginning it probably looked like it should have been more like 20 years or more but, but america putting that much money into the manhattan project was a surprising exactly. set of events and, and i think uh, it's, it's quite hard to say how successful such things were because i guess there are sort of a lot of counterfactuals and if the thing if, if an action works <laughs> then maybe lots of different things happen in history and then it's sort of unclear what would have happened or something. Right. You uh, can't see the change that it makes so clearly. Right. Mm. Um, and also, like, maybe things would have been helpful in expectation under a bunch of scenarios and then it turns out you're in a different scenario. Like, do you count that as good or not? So they got unlucky. So, right. Yeah. So so I think uh, figuring out what happened with Leo Szilard is, is pretty unclear in this regard. Mm. Like, n I think nothing he did was very clearly helpful, um, but it, I think uh, his efforts to keep papers secret and, and not let, I guess, the Germans see the papers uh, seem plausibly helpful. Um, and I guess he, he also wrote, wrote this letter with Albert Einstein that um, helped prompt the Manhattan Project, which seems okay. plausibly yeah. helpful. I mean, so, no, the, the details are... No small deal. Right. <laughs> yeah. So you wrote a report about this? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, we'll get, a, we'll get a link to that and uh, uh, readers can go and, and learn more about it. Um, I don't know a lot about it, but I'm hoping to do an episode with Toby Ord at some point because cool. he's, uh, he's looked into it uh, qu quite a bit and is, is very excited about that example. Huh. I look forward to hearing it. <laughs> <laughs> What's a disagreement that you think you might have with uh, with listeners at large? Is there anything that a lot of people uh, listening you think are getting wrong? I'm not sure off the top of my head, except for like uh, how promising this kind of research is, yeah. um, <laughs> where I assume listeners at large don't agree with me, or at least didn't in the past, since they're not here working on it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 
we asked on the survey what the machine learning researchers, uh, what disagreements they thought they had with um, people who are worried about safety, and, and therefore perhaps with many of the listeners who are also not in machine learning. And, and they thought, uh, I guess, this was an open-ended question, so I sort of categorized all their answers, but popular answers were along the lines of, uh, you just don't realize how narrow narrow AI is, like how general it isn't. Um, like they hear people worrying about general AI and uh, sort of like, this is a really weird concern. We can't make it even a tiny bit general. It just does this one thing that we wrote about in the paper or something. Right. So the thing, uh, so it can play a game in this very specific narrow case, but as soon as you change the parameters, then it's like, then it gets lost very fast. That sort of complaint. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not sure of the exact range of generality and specificity that they're pointing at. Yeah. Um, I mean, what do you, what do you think about that? Uh, are they right? I mean, I haven't checked, but I would guess that this is a thing that they're uh, they have yeah. a lot of expertise on relative to the people speculating about this from the outside. But I guess <laughs> so, so. But 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 on the on the question of like whether this means that we shouldn't worry about general AI now. Uh, right. Yeah. I think I disagree with them about that. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, I less expect them to be right about you know, if things are not very general now. What does that mean about how general they are in like five years or something? Mm. Uh, I think the question of how quickly things can change pr- probably isn't there. as much their area of expertise. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. What what few things would you recommend that uh, a listener who's been interested in this conversation should read next to kind of get up to speed? So I think Elia Ziudkowski had um, uh, an article called uh, Intelligence Explosion Microeconomics that was maybe sort of introducing this whole area of research uh, somewhat and offering some ideas. I think that's uh, often interesting to people. The, the book Superintelligence goes into various um, strategic considerations here, and I think is like a, a good background for just what do people think about these topics and, and maybe what are open questions that would be good to know more about. Mm-hmm. Um, and I ran an online reading group uh, on Less Wrong for that in the past, so, so I guess it goes chapter by chapter and has a bunch of like discussion and further things related to each chapter, which I think is probably also useful for if you want to get into this kind of thing. And then I guess just looking at articles on AI impacts would probably give you a, a better idea of how to do this kind of thing and what, what the questions are. We have featured articles that are better than our other articles. Uh, so <laughs> I, I recommend those ones. All right. So we've been going for quite a long time and uh, we should both get on to, to some other work. But uh, just as a final question, is AI impacts in need of like more funding? And what kind of things uh, would you be able to do if you had more money and, uh, and I guess as a result, more people? Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> we, we are in a position to use more money well. I think uh, the, I think there are many people around who could be usefully doing this kind of research. And uh, as mentioned earlier, <laughs> quite, a, quite a lot of promising research projects, I think. Yeah, so we're interested in hiring more people and, and doing those projects. And I think they could really make a difference to our understanding of what will happen with AI. I guess people can find out more about that and potentially donate at AIimpacts.org. Uh, yes. All right. My guest today has been Katja Grace. Thanks for coming on the show, Katja. Pleasure. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris. Thanks for joining. Talk to you next week.